Hallelujah, hallelujah, Shabbat Shalom family, and welcome to another broadcast. Welcome to the channel. Welcome to our Shabbat Live. I'm so happy that each of you are here today with me. Yahuwah be praised for another day. He's given us another opportunity, another chance to say, praise Yahuwah, another opportunity to pray, another opportunity to hear his word, another opportunity to obey him. And so I greet you all in the name of Yahushua Hamashiach. Much love to you all, family. And I'm going to go through the chat now and welcome each of you here. I first want to welcome my mom who listens every week faithfully. So welcome, mom. Um, honor to my mother. Double honor to my mother. And uh, honor to you all in the chat. So we um, first off this, this new day, we have Sister Lisa. Welcome, Sister Lisa. Faithful, faithful Sister Lisa. And Brother uh, Darnell Blackshear, welcome. It's always good to see you, my brother. Looking to, looking forward to seeing all of you in the kingdom. I've really been thinking about that a lot lately, about what it's going to be like when we get into the kingdom, when we go home to our homeland, and then we put faces to names, and it's just one big, gigantic reunion. It's going to be so wonderful. So just let those happy thoughts fill your mind in the midst of all the craziness. Just let those happy thoughts fill your fill your imagination. Welcome, Mr. The Original School. Looking forward to some good stuff from you in the chat today. T.T. Archer, Shabbat Shalom to you and welcome. My brother, my brother, Calvin, welcome. My brother, my brother, my friend. 
Hallelujah. And welcome, my brother, Calvin. Sister Lucia, so good to see you in the chat again today. So good to see you. Honor to you and to your son, Yosef, Yahoo. Um, praises to the Most High for how faithful he is. So good to see you, beloved sister. Um, sister Valida, welcome and Shabbat Shalom to you. And Sister Jennifer, welcome and Shabbat Shalom to you. I know you got your notebooks ready and your pencil and your pad. Got everything ready today, Sister Jennifer. Um, Sister Mavet uh, Virgo, welcome and Shabbat Shalom to you. Yahuwah's daughter, welcome and Shabbat Shalom. Sister Thadrian, welcome, welcome, welcome. Shabbat Shalom to you. Sister Shirley, my sister Shirley, welcome, 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 beloved. And Shabbat Shalom. Sister Lois, welcome. And Barak Ata, uh, Yahuwah Barak Ata as well. And she says, much shamka, which is joy. Hallelujah. Welcome, dear sister. Uh, welcome, Sister Stephanie. Shabbat Shalom to you. And Brother Kenneth Wil Wilkerson. I, want, I don't know why I said, I saw your name and I wanted to say, what it do? <laughs> I don't know why I wanted to say that, but what it do, Brother Kenneth? Welcome, Ms. Shabbat Shalom to you. Um, Sister Kathy, welcome. She says, peace and blessings to this of this set-apart set apart day that Yahuwah has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it despite the intense heat. Oh, my gosh, Jazz, it's been so hot. It has been so hot. You're right, but it's all a part of the, the judgment that the Father is releasing on the earth. So we have to endure. Welcome, Sir, and Shabbat Shalom, sister. Um, uh, Brother Calvin, did you forget your Folgers? I hope you got it. Hope you got your Folgers. Uh, sister Janet Powell, welcome, and Shabbat Shalom to you. Sister Stephanie, Sister Devorah, welcome. Welcome, Inspired Identity. Peace and blessings to you, dear one. Welcome, welcome, Carolina, Carolina. Welcome, welcome, and Shabbat Shalom. Uh, sister Janet, I think I greeted you. Welcome, and Shabbat Shalom. Sister Mariah. Welcome, dear sister. So good to see you in the chat, as always. Faithful Mariah. And then we have um, Sister Didi. Welcome, and Shabbat Shalom to you. Sister Kenya. Welcome, Sister Kenya. And Sister Michelle ba Byron. Welcome, and Shabbat Shalom to you. Let's see here. Sister Kizzy. Welcome, Sister Kizzy. Welcome, and Shabbat Shalom. Sister Carmen. Sister Yvette. And Eloa Ministries, welcome and Shabbat Shalom to you. Ruth 116, welcome and Shabbat Shalom to you. Marcella Smith and Angie Lavia, welcome and Shabbat Shalom. Shayla Yahoo and Sharperone, welcome and Shabbat Shalom. Sister Regina and Brother Clifford and Sister Angie Lavia, welcome and Shabbat Shalom to you. It's good to see all of you here today. And Sister Valerie Broadnax, welcome, um, Sister Valerie, and Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom to you, Sister Claudine, and Rocky Balboa. Welcome back. Welcome back, Brother Rocky. <laughs> Good to see you in the chat. Sister Tara and LC the Prodigal, welcome to both of you. Shabbat Shalom. Essential Growth, welcome, welcome, dear one. Saint for Yah, welcome, and Shabbat Shalom. Sister Kadmiel, Shabbat Shalom to you, beloved. Beloved Sister Zakia, welcome and Shabbat Shalom. And you love Yah, Salama to you. And Abimelech Harlem Yehuda. That's a beautiful name. It's a mouthful. That's a beautiful name. Welcome and Shabbat Shalom to you. Jolena Gray, welcome and Shabbat Shalom to you. Tobiah Vickers, happy Sabbath to you, dear one. Valerie W. and Nathan Ben Yehuda, welcome and Shabbat Shalom. Sister Leticia, welcome and Shabbat Shalom to you. And Sister Anita, Shabbat Shalom to you, uh, Sister Lady, Sister Lady Dagger, Dagger Status, welcome and Shabbat Shalom. Always love seeing you in the chat. And All About Yah, yep, it is All About Yah. Welcome All About Yah and Shabbat Shalom to you. And she says, special prayer for Yah's protection over our California Mashpaka. I pray he will. I pray he will hear and answer that request. Father, please hear our sister's request. Hallelujah. Welcome, welcome, Sister Valisa, dear one. And scrolling through. 
I'm getting to the end. And Sister Colette, Sister Linda v Jones Vickers, welcome and Shabbat Shalom to you. Sister T. Tanil, welcome and Shabbat Shalom. Seeking Yahuwah and Yahusha Hamashiach. Oh, wow, that's a great name. Welcome and Shabbat Shalom to you. Welcome, welcome and Shabbat Shalom to you, Sister Messenger, Honorable um, Messenger, welcome and Shabbat Shalom. Uh, Dino, Dino Ka, Kahar? Dino Kahar, welcome and Shabbat Shalom to you. I wonder where you are in the world. Makes me curious about where you are. Brother Samuel Nace, welcome and Shabbat Shalom. Light and Salt, welcome and Shabbat Shalom to, to you. Arkawa, Banya, Yasharala, hey, I'm getting better at that. I'm getting better at that, my brother. Welcome and Shabbat Shalom. And Antoinette Wilson, welcome, sister. Clifford possible? Yes, Clifford. All things are possible with the Most High. Welcome and Shabbat Shalom to you. Alex Awala, welcome, my brother. Welcome, welcome. So good to see you in the chat. Sister Cecilia Lewis, welcome to you. Shabbat Shalom. And she says, and Antoinette Wilson said, it's going to be so beautiful. I pray, I pray, I pray. Hallelujah. Welcome and Shabbat Shalom to you and all in the chat. Let's see. Black Butterfly, welcome, Shabbat Shalom. Brother Arthur, good to see you. Welcome, welcome, Shabbat Shalom to you. Shara, Shara, peace and blessings to you. Let's see. <laughs> Jennifer, Sister Jennifer says, yes, I do. I have my notebook ready. <laughs> I know you. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Sister Dee Dee, and let's see. I'm trying not to repeat myself. Let's see. Saf. Safte one, Safte one. Welcome and Shabbat Shalom to you. Chocolate night, oh boy. Chocolate night two. <laughs> Welcome and Shabbat Shalom to you. Chocolate night. Brandon Higgins and Marquetta Epps. Welcome and Shabbat Shalom. Charlia. Welcome, Shabbat Shalom. Uh, Sister Cecilia Lewis. Welcome to you and Shabbat Shalom. Just trust. Great name. Welcome and Shabbat Shalom to you. Tonya, welcome, Sister Tonya. Shabbat Shalom. Welcome, Sister Winnie for ya. It's always good to see you in the chat. Shabbat Shalom to you. And Brother Yahudin, Brother Yahudin, always good to see you, my brother. Always good. Shabbat Shalom to you. Kalani J, welcome, Sister. Beautiful name. Shabbat Shalom to you. Let's see. Jonda Ash, welcome and Shabbat Shalom to you. 78 Vet, always good to see you, beautiful sister. Welcome and Shabbat Shalom. Destiny Rayburn, welcome, Sister Destiny. So good to have you. And I think we're getting close to the end. Let's see. Kanya, welcome, Sister Kanya. And Sister Thea, welcome, Sister Thea. Welcome, beautiful Sister Thea. Nora Reed, welcome and Shabbat Shalom to you. Brother Jason Camphor, welcome, my brother. So good to have you here. Sister Ruhama, good to see you, my sister. Good to see you. Shabbat Shalom to you. Brother Asaph, all honor to Brother Moray Asaph Ben Judah, who's in the house. Double honor to you, beloved brother Asaph Ben Judah. Yah's my strength. Welcome, Shabbat Shalom. Sister Kathleen, welcome, Shabbat Shalom to you. Bread for Zion. Oh, I love that. Bread for Zion. Welcome, Shabbat Shalom to you. Roma Miller, welcome, Shabbat Shalom. His name is Emmanuel. Greetings to you, dear one. And David Miller, welcome, Shabbat Shalom. And I got to the end of the list, family. Hallelujah. Wow, we got quite a uh, group here today. I'm so grateful for all of you being here. I see Stay on Fire Ministries just snuck on in, <laughs> snuck on in the building with his finger up as he walks to his seat. <laughs> Welcome and Shabbat Shalom, Stay on Fire Ministries. Hallelujah. I'm glad that you all are here today and we'll see what the Father has for us today in this lesson. Nothing wasted and thank Yah now. Welcome and Shabbat Shalom. So um, we're going to get started. I'm going to take a sip real quick. And we're going to get started. So just give me one second, please.
Okay. All right. So today is a continuation of the lesson that we began last week on the end of days and the book of Revelation and the judgments that are contained within the scroll that no one had been found worthy to open. No one in heaven and on earth had been found worthy to open these scrolls except for Yahusha, the son of Yahuwah, the son of the highest. And he was found worthy because of what he did, because of how he obeyed the father in all things to open the scrolls and release the seals and bring about the events that we're going to be talking about today. So let me get my slides in order and I'll be right with you, family. Okay, so we're going to be talking today about the seventh seal and the seven trumpets because there's so much going on in those in the seventh seal, which is, ex, is which is actually the sixth seal. There was a pause. Remember, we talked about that last week. The sixth seal was open and released. There was a pause so that the father could seal his servants in their foreheads. And then, <laughs> just a second. <laughs> this is funny. <laughs> Thank you, Essential Growth. Maria, did you call your mother? No, beloved. She called me. <laughs> she called me today and said, are you going live today? Yes, mother. <laughs> so thank you for the reminder. You're so wonderful. Oh, I just love this family. You all are so wonderful. Thank you for the, thank you for the reminder. Yeah, she called me today and said, are you going live today? So yeah, she's, all, she's with us. Thank you for that. That's so precious to me. Hallelujah. You all are so precious. Hallelujah. Okay. So um, that totally got me in a happy place. So let, let, me, let me refocus. Okay. So um, so we, we talked about the seventh seal and the sixth seal on last week, but we didn't go into detail regarding it. And remember, we described the seventh seal as being the sixth seal that came after the father paused so he could seal his servants in their foreheads. Okay. So the seventh seal is essentially the event of the sixth seal, but what's been added to the sixth seal, excuse me, what's been added to the seventh seal is just this um, in implication that the father is answering the prayers of the saints. Those who have been crying out under the altar, under the earth, in the grave for justice. They have been crying out and crying out. And the father is saying, I am allowing your prayers to waft up into my, into my temple and into my ears. And I have heard and I will respond. And uh, then the response has to be judgment. Sister Elsa Thadrian says, mother must be in the house. Absolutely, dear sister. Absolutely. Mother must be in the house. Blessings to you, um, Saint for ya. Okay. So we're going to get started today. I'm going to do a little bit of a recap. Um, before we move, move back into the lesson for today. And so I've already begun the recap, actually. So remember, Yahusha, was a, he was awarded the, the dignity and the honor of being able to open the seals and bring about the events that we're going to be discussing today. And as a result of that, we find him being given honor and authority and power because of what he did and unleashing these seals and being faithful to the father to serve in the capacity of kinsman redeemer for the nation of Yashara. Okay. So in the opening of the seals, we saw the four horsemen being released into the, into the world. And we discussed last week, what I saw, what the father showed me with regard to the four horsemen, where the white horse represents he who has been given the power to go forth, to conquer and to conquer, conquering and to conquer. That's how he goes forth and that he is indicative of the rule of Esau. He is indicative of the rule and the reign of Esau, not just because he's a white horse and Esau is best represented in the Caucasian race, those who have colonized the whole world, not just because he's a white horse, but also the white horse indicates some sort of religious order, that there would be a religion associated with the rule of this horse. 
horses in the scripture represent power, strength, might, authority. And then the red horse came and he came to take peace away from the earth and to bring war. And the same rider of the white horse is the rider of the red horse. Okay. He comes to take peace from the earth using his sword. And he's also been given a bow and he always presents to us in his images, his arrows. And then we have the black horse, the scales, which indicates the, the money uh, in, in control of the money and the banks and the systems. And he can determine who eats and who doesn't eat, who has good uh, fortune and who has bad fortune based on how he manipulates the scales. Okay. And then we see the pale horse who has come to bring death and hell followers, follows after it. And so what we see here is are the four horsemen that have been unleashed against the nation of Yasharal as judgment for not obeying the father's commandments and for rejecting our Messiah. When Yahusha said, your house is left unto you desolate, this is what he was talking about. He was talking about the seals that were going to be unleashed against us. Okay. And so the first four seals were the judgment against the nation of Yasharal. The fifth seal, we saw our ancestors crying out from the from under the altar in the earth in the grave for our justice and for the father to vindicate them for those who have lost their had lost their lives uh, sharing the basora and then after that we see the sixth seal and when the sixth seal comes that's when the action really starts so part of that judgment that i discussed was the destruction of our homeland our city we were booted out sold into slavery and experienced all manner of horror the souls under the altar began to cry out to the Most High for justice, for vengeance, and he heard them. And then we have the sixth seal. He told them, let me give your robe. I'm going to give your robe. Just rest a little season until your fellow brothers and sisters be killed as you have been killed, meaning they're going to be martyred doing the work of the Father, sharing the Besorah, holding the testimony of Yahusha. We also discuss that we can find that in Revelation chapter 11, and those are the two witnesses also called the 144,000 who will go forth teaching, preaching, and they will be martyred by the beast that comes up from the, from the abyss, the bottomless pit. Okay. This should be all, re all uh, recap from last week. Okay. So before we get into the lesson for today, it becomes necessary for me to get into a little bit of science. Okay. Just a little bit, because some of the things that the father has revealed to me regarding what's coming it's difficult to explain just based on symbols. I can, exp I can explain it to you based on the symbols, but it's not going to really give you a clear understanding or give me a clear understanding of what is going on. So the father has had me, I feel like I've gone back to school. I've been studying physics. I've been looking into astronomy and all manner of things that I've never really studied before. So I pray that he uses the information that he's given to me for his glory so we're going to be talking about these things today. So the first thing I'm going to mention is just a brief talk on electromagnetism, because I never really thought about the concept of electromagnetism before, but in my research for this study, um, it's really interesting how powerful a force it is. So according to wikipedia.com, we have electromagnetism is one of the fundamental forces of nature. Early on, Electricity and magnetism were studied separately and regarded as separate phenomena. Hans Christian Orsted discovered that the two were related. Electric currents give rise to magnetism. Michael Faraday discovered the converse, that magnetism could induce electric currents. And then James Clerk Maxwell put the whole thing together in a unified theory of electromagnetism. Okay? So... Long story short in this is that you have the you have electricity, which we know is the power uh, in the in the earth whereby atoms exchange electrons and neutrons, excuse me, electrons and protons, and that activity creates electricity. When that activity is in motion, you have electromagnetism. And that's essentially what it's saying. But electromagnetism is important for more reasons than I ever understood. Electromagnetism is the force in the universe that ties everything together. Okay. 
Now, if you all knew, if you all know this, give me a one in the chat if you knew this, because I certainly didn't know. Okay. Electromagnetism is a tremendous and important force in the world. Everything in the world that the father created is comprised of atoms. Okay. It's all been put together by, with atoms, but there's space in between the neutrinos and the quarks and all the different aspects of the atom. There's tons of space or oh, brother Lance is brilliant. <laughs> you know, brother Lance knew. I certainly didn't. Sister Jennifer knew <laughs> this was all new to me. Sister Stephanie knew. I'm so glad of those of you who, who knew, but to me, this is, this was a, a lesson. Sister Lady Dag Daggerstad is new. Yah is my strength, says, let there be light. Hallelujah. Sister Vor Devor Yah, Sister T Tara Lester new as well. But let's, just, for example, look at this chair. This chair, <laughs> Ruhama, Ruhama gave a negative one. <laughs> yep, yeah, I'm with you, sister. <laughs> I'm with you. Hallelujah. So let's, let's, for example, take a look at this chair. Okay. This chair has space in it. You can see through the space of this chair. This is a perfect representation of how everything in the world looks. Everything appears to have a solidity to it, but it's got spaces in between it. And if, and rightfully so, when you sat down on a couch, you should fall through it because of all the spaces that exists in it and in you. Electromagnetism holds everything together with an electric charge. And so those spaces that you could fall through, it's like it supports you and buttresses you up so that you don't fall through. It gives solidity to things and it upholds everything and holds it all together in all the universe. Now, who does that sound like, family? Who does that sound like? A force, a powerful force, a magnetic electric force that holds all things together. And if this force disappeared, everything would fall apart. It would disappear and cease to exist. Who does that sound like? Absolutely, Sister Valida. Absolutely. Absolutely, Brother David. Yes, Sister Inspired Identity. I lost your comment, Brother David. Yes, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And as I'm studying this, I'm thinking, oh my goodness. I'm seeing the father. I'm seeing his, his wisdom in science. And I'm like, but they don't attribute it to him. They don't say that. It's very possible that this whole concept of electromagnetism is the father in the world. Think about it. The scripture teaches us that in him, we live, we move, we have our being. Okay. In electromagnetism, we live, we move, we have our being. And if it wasn't for this force, we wouldn't even be. We would cease to be. We would cease to exist. It's just, it's just brilliant. It's just brilliant once I begin to learn these things. So just let this chair be an example of what the world looks like without the force of electromagnetism, okay? So let me do this just a second. Okay. So I have on the scripture, Yahuwah upholds, I should be upholds. Yahuwah upholds all things by the power of his word. And in him, we live, move, and have our very being. Hallelujah. So along the lines of continuing our, our scientific lesson here, we have the concept of electromagnetism as it relates to the world. Now, the rendering here of what the world looks like is not what I believe it looks like, but it's difficult to find images that convey what I believe the world looks like and then have them talk about the things we're talking about. So just keep in mind that I believe that we live in a closed system with a firmament, just like the father said, okay? But even within that closed system with a firmament, we have poles in the earth. And the earth is structured after a bar magnet with a northern um, pole and a southern pole. And sometimes those poles flip, as you can see. You see the north there on the bottom and the south on the top. You see that? They flip back and forth, okay, over a course of time. And that's going to be important in our lesson today. So in this bar magnet, you see opposite charges on either end of the, of the earth. 
and there's a, an electromagnetic field that the earth produces that protects it from solar radiation that comes from space, that comes from the sun, okay? So if it weren't for this electromagnetic field that encircles and wraps the earth, all of the, the particles, the solar rays, the geomagnetic storms, the coronal mass ejections, all of those ionic particles would, would bombard the earth constantly and we'd be in constant jeopardy. So the electromagnetic field is like an electromagnetic blanket that the father placed around the earth to protect it. Every now and then you have something powerful enough to get through and it will affect the earth. And you'll see those in the Aurora Borealis at the poles. So this force hits the, hits the magnetic field and the energies are distributed and they come in at the poles. And all you see is this beautiful light display. Okay. It's not always like that. If it's powerful enough, if the force, if the CME is powerful enough, you will see, we'll see more of an effect, but we're going to get into that as we go on. Okay. So the earth here, we see uh, a, a North pole and a South, South pole, of course, but you also see a magnetic North pole and a magnetic South pole. Okay. Did you know that we had two poles? Did you know we had a magnetic pole and a geographic pole? So the geographic pole, of course, is due north. But the geographic magnetic, excuse me, but the magnetic north pole is oftentimes just to the right or to the left of the geographic north pole. And the same is true for the south pole. They're not the same, okay? And the, and the magnetic pole is where the compass aligns to. So if you get your compass out, it's going to align to that magnetic North Pole, not necessarily the geographic North Pole. They're different. Okay. Sister Cecilia says this takes her back to science class. <laughs> yes. Yes. This is, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. Okay. So continuing on. So we have this idea, like I said, of a North Pole and a South Pole. And every now and then they flip polarities where the North becomes the South and the South becomes the North, they flip. And as they're in the process of flipping, the magnetic poles begin to shift. They begin to move. So let's say for instance, the magnetic North um, pole position right now is supposed to be somewhere around Ellesmere Island in Canada, Northern Canada. That's where it's supposed to be, but that's not where it is right now because it's been moving. It's been moving for the past hundred years and it is headed to Siberia. It's been moving steadily away from its location because the earth is in the midst of a flip, a magnetic flip, okay? That's gonna be important as we talk about these judgments that are coming up. So please try to stick with me, okay? In addition to that, the human body also has a magnetic field, just in case you didn't know, in case you didn't realize it, we possess a magnetic field. So not only do we have a field that, that comes from the top of our head and then goes to the soles of our feet, even though this doesn't show it, there's also a separate magnetic field that comes directly from our hearts. So it's like a wheel within a wheel. Does that sound familiar? Like a wheel within a wheel. And so this is the father's presence, his essence, on us, in us, electrifying us, sustaining us, keeping us. Okay. It's just, it's just brilliant. Brilliant. The father is so brilliant. And if he were to withdraw that, we would just cease to be. Yes. Yes. Ezekiel. That's right. Ezekiel one. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Abimelech. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we talked a second about a, mag, a geomagnetic reversal. And what that is, is what I just described. It's essentially having these two polarities, the north and the south, change positions. But in the process of changing position, some things happen. Some things happen to the earth. Some things happen to the sun. Some things happen wherever this is happening. Things happen. So let me read this article real quickly, and then we're going to continue on. A geomagnetic reversal is a change in a planet's magnetic field such that the positions of magnetic north and magnetic south are interchanged, not to be confused with the geographic north 
and geographic south. The Earth's field has alternated between periods of normal polarity in which the predominant direction of the field was the same as the present direction or reverse polarity in which it was the opposite. These periods are called cryons. Okay, so as I stated before, we're in the midst of one of these magnetic reversals, one of these flips, okay, that's happening right now. We are in the midst of it, okay? And it is associated with times of judgment, okay? I'm taking a pause. Okay. So if you see on the screen here, this is a picture of what it looks like. You see the hairy, fuzzy lines on the on the north of this, what's rendered as the earth here, and then the blue lines on the bottom. This is an indication of the polarities. One is negative, one is positive, okay? And so the orange one would represent the northern polarity and the one on the bottom, the blue would represent the southern polarity. What begins to happen during a magnetic shift is that everything gets all mixed up with one another. The orange starts to venture into the blue territory and the blue starts to venture into the red, into the orange territory until eventually they become so intermeshed with one another that they flip the blue moves to the orange location and the orange moves to the blue location, okay? And you have a flip. So then now the north becomes probably, let's say for instance, the north was positively charged. In the flip, then the north would become negatively charged and the south would become positively charged, okay? It sounds pretty harmless, right? And it would be, and it would be normally, okay? There's a picture on the screen here that shows you what it looks like when the when the polarities become all immersed with one another. You see how the north is in places where it shouldn't be? You see how the south, the southern pole is in places where it shouldn't be, the magnetic field, I mean? This is what happens when you have this flip or this reversal that's happening, like I said, right now. We are, we're in the process of one and have been in the process of one for some time, okay? So according to this article here, I'm just going to show you just a little bit um, of the science, like I said, that's happening right now. It says the sun's activity could peak two years early, frying satellites and causing radio blackouts by the end of this year, experts say. So all eyes right now are on the sun to see what it will do, because when the sun also has a magnetic field and the sun's polarity also shifts. That happens every 11 years. Every 11 years, the sun's polarity shifts. North goes to south and south goes to north. One of the things that happens when these heavenly bodies shift their polarity is their magnetic field. Remember I mentioned the magnetic field that protects them from the, the sun, from the magnetic activity, from the solar particles, from the radiation of the sun. That magnetic field weakens. And the earth's magnetic field has been weakening steadily over the past hundred years, okay? And so what that means is, this article is saying that the sun's activity could peak two years early. So when the sun's activity peaks at a time where the earth is experiencing a magnetic reversal and weakening fields, that means just your standard um, M-class flare or X-class flare could wipe out the grid and take us back to the stone ages. You hear me, family? It's coming. It's coming. Let's continue on. It reads, a solar plasma waterfall was spotted on the sun recently. More odd solar phenomena has been seen recently as the sun nears peak activity. So right now the sun is in the midst of a, what's called a solar minimum. It's in its minimum phase, meaning solar activity is supposed to be reduced, but it's not. It's not, it has not been reduced, but it's supposed to be. The sun's magnetic field has also been weakening. And so the solar, I shouldn't say solar, so the galactic particles that are in the, in the atmosphere affect the sun to a greater degree because the sun field also is weakening because it too is in the midst of a flip right now. So the earth is in the midst of a flip and the sun is in the midst of a flip right now, okay? It reads, the sun is becoming more active and may reach peak activity sooner than expected. So we're in the midst of a solar minimum right now. 
The solar maximum is supposed to start in 2025, but they're saying because of the activity of the sun, they think that we're going to peak out and move into solar maximum. Some people are saying this year and some are saying next year, okay? It says uh, an unusual burst of sunspots this year suggests solar maximum could hit by the end of 2023. Continuing, the sun is growing more active, which is expected. Our sun has an 11 year cycle where it increases and, de and decreases in activity. What's unexpected is how soon it will reach solar maximum. We're currently approaching solar maximum currently. And when the sun reaches peak activity, which experts have predicted should happen in 2025, but we're also seeing that they're thinking it should happen a little sooner than that. But the sun's recent behavior suggests solar maximum will hit sooner, perhaps by the end of this year, meaning by the end of 2023. It's going to peak earlier and it's going to peak higher than expected. A solar physicist at the University of College London, Alex James, told Live Science. So why is the solar maximum a threat to Earth? The solar maximum is a time when the sun's magnetic field is extremely weak. And that's not great news for Earth. Normally, the solar magnetic field acts as a shield constraining solar radiation and reducing the risk of potentially harmful ev events like solar flares and coronal mass ejections or CMEs. Examples of solar storms. When the storm breaks, it fires high energy particles into space. And one of one off chance, one of those particles strikes earth can cause lots of damage. So this is an animation of the solar wind that comes from the sun. So the sun is constantly producing a solar wind that's full of ionic particles and radiation and plasma and things of that. It's constant. The earth's magnetic field is protecting it from it. But if the earth's magnetic field is weak, it doesn't afford as much um, protection from that. And when the sun's magnetic field is weak, it shoots out more. So you can see that this creates like a perfect storm. My, the tops of my slides are cut off, I apologize. When the sun's magnetic field is weak, its surface gets a lot more interesting to look at. For example, the solar surface develops temporary black blemishes called sunspots, which are regions where the magnetic field is especially strong in one area. This chokes the hot flow of fresh gas from the sun's interior to the surface, cooling that region and making it appear black, okay? So when you see a sunspot on the sun, it's an example of a really strong magnetic field in that area, okay? Here's an example of a sunspot group. So it says sunspots like the one shown here are cooler than their surrounding, which is why they appear black. But don't be misled. The typical temperature of a sunspot is 7,600 degrees Fahrenheit. That's hot. That's pretty hot. Hallelujah. Meanwhile, the powerful magnetism behind the sunspots can brew eruptions. So as the sun grows more active and its magnetic field throbs and tangled more wildly, scientists expect more sunspot and more solar flares and CMEs than can erupt them. I, I know you see where I'm going here. If the sun's putting out more and the earth is less able to handle it, we can see that that presents a problem. You can see that, okay? Therefore, by monitoring the number of frequency of sunspots, scientists can track the solar cycles. And so that's what they're doing. They're constantly looking at the sun to monitor, to see what it's doing so they can wish and hope. There's really nothing we can do. If our, if our magnetic field is weakening and not able to protect us, there is nothing we can do. Just hide. That's all you can do. Put on lots of sunscreen. There's nothing you can do about it. This is the father's business. Okay, so this is just an image on the screen of what a solar minimum looks like on the sun and a solar maximum. Note that there's more activity on the left, on the right side of the screen with a solar maximum as opposed to the solar minimum. Currently, we are in a solar minimum moving toward a solar maximum. Okay. And that happens, as I said, every 11 years, just about. Okay. So I'm going to um, skip ahead. There's That's talking about the number of sunspots that we've had. Okay. I wish my slides weren't cut off at the top. They were fine when I, when I uploaded them 
and now it's cut off. So I won't be able to read the entire article at the top because the slides are cut off. And I apologize for that. Okay, so this article is talking about um, a CME that washed over the earth March 24th of this year. And it created a powerful geomagnetic storm pushing the Aurora Borealis as far south as Arizona. Now, family, you all know about the Northern Lights, and they're called Northern Lights for a reason. Typically, you don't see them in Arizona. That's too far south. And I also read an article that said that they have been seeing Aurora Borealis in Florida. That's too far south for Aurora Borealis. So I'm going to ask you this question, okay? If you see an Aurora Borealis heading south, say, for instance, in Arizona or Florida, what do you believe that's an indication of? What is that telling us? The fact that you see the sign of geomagnetic activity in the earth, because that's what an aurora borealis is telling us. It's telling us that there are solar particles present. What does it mean that they have come so far south? Sister Leticia says they're in Maryland last month. In Maryland, Typically, you have to go to Canada to see the Northern Lights. Now you can go to Maryland, Arizona, Florida. Yes, that's exactly right, Abimelech. That's exactly right. All of this. All of this. Yes. It's coming. It's coming. That's exactly right. It's flipping. So what you're seeing in addition to all of this is you're seeing... Additional, the two energies are chasing place. Yes, yes, yes. A shift, yes. Let's see. Um, a shift. Everything is out of whack. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Brother Calvin says, time's up for drunk Uncle Esau. <laughs> oh, Father. Time's up. Hallelujah. I'm on. Everything's flipping. So what that's telling you, if the aurora borealis is a sign of electrical charged particles in the atmosphere, having them come so far south means there's more of them. And there's more of them because our magnetic field is so weak. So because it's so weak, it's letting in more than it normally would. And because it's letting in more than it normally would, you see the sign of it extending farther and farther south, okay? That's what we're seeing. You should not normally be seeing Aurora Borealis or Northern Lights in Arizona or Maryland. You just shouldn't. It's just not typical, okay? Yes, everything's flipping for sure. So these are the signs that the Father told us to watch for. He told us to watch for signs in the stars, in the sun, and in the moon. He told us. He told us, and so we should be watching. second family my screen is messed up just give me a second family okay part of my screen was cut off and i couldn't see it so there is more there are more words there i just couldn't see it so i apologize i got it unflip unstuck so um, thank you for your patience. Okay, it says here, an array of other unusual solar phenomena also point to an early solar maximum, a vortex on the sun's north pole, a plasma waterfall, a tornado-like twisting prominence, and giant holes forming in the sun's outer atmosphere. So this is just a sign, as the sun does what it's going to do right now, is it's being really active, even during a solar minimum. The earth is less able to handle those energies, it's just, it's a setup. It's, it's just, just a setup for what's coming. So, and what's coming? Solar storms, solar storms. So in the situations like this, when the sun is active and the plasma is roiling and the magnetic fields are strong and powerful, it unleashes solar flares, M-class, X-class being stronger and or coronal mass ejections. So solar, fl solar flares are the equivalent of electromagnetic radiation being sent to the earth. If there's a, f a flash, 
of light on the sun and a release of a solar flare, that electromagnetic radiation reaches the earth in about eight minutes because it travels at the speed of light. So about eight minutes later, you're going to feel those, those solar particles hit the earth. You may or may not, depending on how strong and how powerful the flash was or the flare was. When you have a coronal mass ejection, you have um, ionic particles from the sun, plasma being released from the sun that travels at a tremendous rate of speed. But still, because it's not radiation, it takes anywhere from eight hours to two to three days to reach the earth, okay? And then have its effect depending on how powerful and how strong it was in the first place. So these are the types of things that you're going to be see happening more and more and more as time goes on. So what I want to talk about now is the Carrington event, because the Carrington event is something that we can learn from. It's, it was a geomagnetic storm that occurred in the year 1859. And we can learn much about the Carrington event because we can see the events that took place in 1859 and we can then extrapolate and translate those things to the times that we're in now so we can know what to look for, okay? And that's what I've been doing. I've been instructed by the Father to study it so that we can know what to look for. We can know what the signs are for the coming big one, you know, big release from the sun, and then the earth trying to do the best it can to protect itself when its fields are weak. So this says, the Carrington event, history's greatest solar storm. Extreme solar storms, um, as the 1859 Carrington event, can play havoc with technology on Earth. And that's not the only thing it affects. Of course, it affects technology. But there are far-reaching um, consequences of a storm like this hitting the Earth. And it reads, the Carrington event was a large solar storm that took place at the beginning of September in 1859. Note that that was a year before Emancipation Proclamation. I just made that, I just thought about that today. Just a few months before the solar maximum of 1860. In August of 1859, astronomers around the world watched with fascination as the number of sunspots on the solar disk grew. Among them was Richard Carrington, an amateur sky watcher in a small town called Red Hill near London in England. On September 1st, as Carrington was sketching the sunspots, he was blinded by a sudden flash of light. Carrington described it as white light flare, according to the NASA space flight. The whole event lasted about five minutes. The flare was a major coronal mass ejection, a burst of magnetized plasma from the sun's upper atmosphere, the corona. And 17.6 hours, the CME traversed 90 million miles. Well, they're saying the distance between the earth and the sun is 90 million miles. I don't believe that. So that's, that's their belief. Anyway, the sun is closer than that. Um, according to NASA space flight, it actually takes um, the CMA multiple days to reach earth, but this one got here much sooner because of the strength and power of it. The day after Carrington observed the impressive flare, Earth experienced an unprecedented geomagnetic storm with telegraph systems going haywire and auroral displays normally confined to polar latitudes visible in the tropics, according to NASA. Now I'm going to pause here, family. You, you'll notice here that during the solar flare, they were seeing auroras in the tropics. They were seeing them in Cuba. Now Cuba is just south of Florida. So they were seeing auroras where they shouldn't see them. We're seeing auroras now where we shouldn't see them. It's a sign. It's a sign. Continuing. Carrington put two and two together and realized that the solar flare he'd never, excuse me, the solar flare he'd seen was almost certainly the cause of this massive geomagnetic disturbance. This was a connection that had never been previously made, according to NASA's spaceflight. The solar storm of 1859, now known as the Carrington event, in his honor. The origin of space weather can be traced to contortions in the sun's magnetic field, lead, leading to dark blotches or sunspots on its surface. And we've already discussed that. 
What happened during the event? The Carrington event sparked a huge geomagnetic storm that wreaked havoc with technology. And the only technology they had back then was the telegraph. Earth fell silent as telegraph communications around the world failed. Imagine if this happened, the same thing, no more powerful, just the same level of power. Imagine if it happened today. What would happen to your cell phone in your hand? What would happen to your, to your, your Hulu and your Apple TV and your um, Amazon Fire TV or Fire Stick? What would happen to your laptop? What would happen to your smart oven, your smart washer, your smart dryer? What would happen to these things? They'd be fried. They'd be fried. So we see that this current society is much more dependent on technology and electricity. So if it, if it goes out the window, there's going to be a much greater effect. According to history.com, there were reports of sparks showering from telegraph machines, operators receiving electric shocks, and paper set ablaze by rogue sparks. Now, now keep in mind that electricity was not widely available in 1859. So the electricity that these people, the electric shocks are coming out of the air, family. It's coming out of the air. And some of it was traveling along the, along the telegraph lines. So there were spontaneous fires igniting. Does that sound familiar? Spontaneous fires traveling along, along the electrical lines. Does that sound familiar? Papers being set ablaze by rogue sparks. Striking auroras dazzled sky watches around the world as polar light shows stretched far beyond their usual ranges. The northern lights or the aurora borealis was witnessed as far south as Cuba and Honolulu, Hawaii. Whilst normal lights, the aurora Austra australis or the southern lights were seen as far north as Santiago, Chile, according to National Geographic. For many people around the world, this was the first time they'd ever witnessed the aurora and didn't know what to make of the brighter than usual skies. While some believe the end of the world had arrived, others began to start their day after hearing the birds chirping, seeing the bright skies and believing the sun had begun to arise. So and according to my additional research, it was about 1 a.m., between 1 and 2 a.m., it was so bright outside that people could read a newspaper by the light that was outside, okay? In addition to that, they started getting up and getting ready to go to work because they're like, oh, it's sun, it's daytime, it's morning, the birds are chirping, it's 1 a.m., it's 2 a.m., but it's time to get up and go to work. This is what was happening during this, this light show of the solar storm called the Carrington event. When telegraph workers returned to work the following day, the effects of the Carrington event were still being felt as the atmosphere was still very charged History.com reported that the American Telegraph Company employees found it impossible to transmit or receive dispatches. Alarmingly, they found that they could, however, unplug the batteries. They did not have electricity. They had battery power, DC power. They could unplug their batteries and transmit messages to Portland, Maine, using only the current in the auroral field. No battery power. That's how electrically charged the air was. And so the aurora borealis being seen as far south as it was, and the aurora australis being seen as far north as it was, is a sign that the air was extremely electrically charged, electromagnetically charged, okay? And this is the effect it had on their telegraph machines. Technology, it would be much, much, much worse. So here's a picture of what a, um, an aurora would look like. The sky would be, would have all various shades of colors, but particularly there seems to be a focus on reds and greens, okay? So this is what it looks like. If you see an aurora borealis where you are, in Florida or Texas or wherever, just be aware. It's not typical for you to be able to see that that far south. It's a sign that the atmosphere is charged with particles from the sun. That's what it's showing. This additional article, A, Sol a Perfect Solar um, Superstorm, 
1859 Carrington event. Okay, so we're going to read some of that as well. On the morning of September 1st, 1859, amateur astronomer Richard Carrington ascended into the private observatory attached to his country estate outside of London. After cranking open the dome shutters to reveal the clear blue sky, blue sky, he pointed his brass telescope toward the sun and began to sketch a cluster of enormous dark spots that freckled its surface. Suddenly, Carrington spotted what he described as two patches of intensely bright and white light erupting from the sunspots. Five minutes later, the fireballs vanished, but within hours, their impact would be felt across the globe. Okay, so we've already read about the telegraph effect, so we're going to skip ahead. Many telegraph lines across North America were rendered inoperable on the night of August 28th as the first of two successive solar storms struck. E.W. Culgan, a telegraph manager in Pittsburgh, reported that the resulting currents flowing through the wires were so powerful that platinum contacts in, were in danger of melting and streams of fire were pouring forth from the surface, circus. Family, listen to this. Streams of fire were pouring out of the circuits. Yes, think Hawaii. Really, they're telling us, they don't know what started this fire. We know that a few days before they had the storm, there had been a CME. The earth right now is extremely charged with particles from the sun because it has little protection. It has less protection, I should say, than it normally does from these charged particles that are coming in. Streams of fire were pouring in from their circuits. But here's the, but here's the thing, and I don't want you to miss this. Look at the date. This happened on the night of August 28th. The Carrington event happened on September 1st. So this was a precursor to the Carrington event. Think about that. This happened on the night of August 28th. On the 28th, you had two successive solar storm strike. They were like precursors to the big deal that came on September 1st. Okay. And even during the precursor, you had streams of fire pouring forth from circuits. There are reports in Maui of the electrical power lines that line the streets in Maui on fire, the electric lines. Could it be that those lines were sparked by electrical currents that are in the air in the atmosphere right now? Could it be? In Washington, D.C., telegraph operator Frederick W. Royce was severely shocked as his forehead grazed a ground wire. According to a witness, an arc of fire jumped from Royce's head to the telegraphic equipment. Some telegraph stations that use chemicals to mark sheets reported that powerful surges caused telegraph paper to combust. Fire, fire everywhere, and it's in the air. We're seeing the signs of these things now because we are in the time of these things happening. On the morning of September 2nd, the magnetic mayhem resulting from the second storm created even more chaos for telegraph operators. When American telegraph company employees arrived at their Boston office at 8 a.m., they discovered it was impossible to transmit or receive dispatches. The atmosphere was so charged. However, the operators made an incredible discovery that they could unplug their batteries and still transmit mute messages to Portland. At 30 to 96, at 19, blah, blah, 30 to 90 second intervals using only their role current. Messages still couldn't be sent as seamlessly under normal conditions, but it was still a useful workaround. By 10 a.m., the magnetic disturbance abated enough that the stations reconnected their batteries, but transmissions were still affected for the rest of the morning. When telegraphs did come back online, many were filled with vivid accounts of the celestial light show that had been witnessed the night before. Newspapers from France to Australia featured glowing descriptions of brilliant auroras that had turned night into day. One eyewitness account from a woman on Sullivan's Island in South Carolina ran in the Charleston Mercury. The eastern sky appeared as of a blood red color. It seemed brightest exactly in the east as though the full moon 
or rather the, the sun were about to rise. It extended almost to the zenith. The whole island was illuminated. The sea reflected this phenomenon and no one could look at it without thinking of the passage in the Bible, which says the sea was turned to blood. The shells on the beach reflecting light resembled coals of fire. Yes, yes, a Rocky. I was reading, just reading that this morning, the sky, the elements being burnt up with fervent heat. Where does this fervent heat come? It comes from the sun. It comes from the sun. Hallelujah. The sky was so crimson that many who saw it believed that the neighboring locales were on fire. Americans in the South were particularly startled by the Northern lights. Yeah, because not, they're not used to getting Northern lights in, in the South which migrated so close to the equator that they were seen in Cuba and Jamaica. Elsewhere, however, there appeared to be genuine confusion. In Abbeville, South Carolina, Masons awoke and began to lay bricks at their job site until they realized the hour and then went back to bed. <laughs> Just imagine. Imagine getting up and going to work at 2, 3 a.m. and realizing it's still nighttime. In Bealton, Virginia, Larks were stirred from their sleep at 1 a.m. and began to warble. Unfortunately for them, a conductor on the Orange and Alexandria Railroad was also awake and shot three of them dead. <laughs> Who does that? Who wakes up in the middle of the night, hear birds chirping, warbling, and shoots them? Anyway, in cities across America, people stood in the streets and gazed up at the heavenly pyrotechnics. In Boston, some even caught up on their reading, taking, taking advantage of the celestial fire to peruse the local newspapers. Okay, so I wanted to tell you about the Carrington event because a Carrington event is a pivotal event in the Earth's history, recent history, meaning stuff that we can remember. Could there have been solar storms worse than this in history? Certainly, but it's not something that the modern human being would know about or have experienced, but this they experienced. And so it can give us clues. One of the things the father told me to look out for when we're about to experience something pretty significant from the sun, he said, look for auroras in places where they shouldn't be. That's happening now, brothers and sisters. That's happening now. You're seeing auroras in places where they shouldn't be. It's a sign of the Earth's weakening magnetic field, and it's a sign of the sun shooting out particles toward the Earth that are being received by the Earth instead of being blocked by its field. Now, also keep in mind that during this time of the Carrington event, the effect that the Earth experienced was at a time where the Earth's magnetic field was not weakened. Think about that. If you had sparks of fire um, you had pyrotechnics in the sky. You had the sky being red and reflecting back onto the earth, onto the water, making it look as if it had turned to blood. If you had all of these things happening and the field was not in a weakened state, imagine the effect if you had the same level of geomagnetic storm today with our now current weakened, weakening fields. Okay? You can see what we're looking at here. Okay. So I have a little article here now about um, the impending solar flash, what's called a uh, micronova or solar flash that's coming. And people have been dreaming about these things. I had a dream. I, I want to call it a vision. It was last week. And I want to call it a vision because I don't even remember being asleep. But in my dream vision, I saw just, I saw the sun and it was just a flash and I saw rays from the sun going out in every different direction. I, it was just like just this flash. And that's all I saw. That's all I saw. That and all the light that came from the sun as a result of this flash. Others of you have been having dreams and visions of the fire. Thought Father showing you not only the darkness, but something happening with the sun. Okay? Don't ignore these things. Write them down. Pray through and ask the Father what he's communicating to you through these dreams. This is almost too small for me to read. 
Let's see here. Okay, so I'm going to skip down to the second uh, paragraph. In part four of his video series, um, Ben Davidson presents scientific studies showing how micronovas have been observed during uh, occurring in multiple stars by astronomers. A micronova is Davidson's term for a supernova type event that is not large enough to exhaust or destroy the star generating it, but large enough to devastate devastate planets nearby. Okay, so do you do you all know what a micro what a supernova is? Okay, I want someone to tell me what a supernova is so I can put it up on the screen. What's a supernova? Uh, Sister Loa says, there's been a lot of dog attacks lately, strange behavior. That too is scriptural. The scripture talks about the animals turning against humanity, I believe in the book of Second Ezra. So that too is biblical prophecy. Yes, it is. Um, honey, honey in the rocks as a star is born. Essentially, essentially right. Essentially right. Uh, Sister Leticia says, my dream was so vivid. You were describing the flares and the flashes just as I saw. Yes. And that's all I saw. That's, that's the only thing I saw, just this going in every direction, just this flares coming from the sun. And then that that's all the father showed me. And I was like, wow, wow. So I don't know. I might, I might have you come on Sister TC and share your dream. I may. So we'll just have to see how we manage the time. Okay. I'll, I'll let you know. I'll let you know. If Sister TC had a tremendous dream about just the thing we're talking about right now. Okay, the explosion of a star. Yes, the explosion of a star. It is a creative event, Sister Belita. It is. Sister Yvette, let's see. I lost your comment. There it is. A star gets bright just before it destroys itself. Absolutely right. Sister Leticia says, essentially a supernova, no, supernova is an explosion of a star. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Brother Asaph says, Malachi 4, verse 1, um, Revelation 16, verse 8. Okay, and he gives these verses. He, he speaks about the fires. Isaiah 24, verse 3 says, the land will be emptied. These events are going to be as my, yes, this is exactly what's happened. The, the Father has spoken. He has spoken multiple times in multiple verses of scripture. The land is going to be emptied. It's going to be emptied. And this isn't even the worst part, family. This is just the beginning. If you know, if you knew what was coming, oh my word, what I'm telling you right now was bad, but this is just the beginning. I hadn't even told you the bad part yet. So hold on to your socks. I hadn't even told you the bad part yet. So, okay. Tell Sister Talmita, Sister Talmita is such a scholar. Um, she says, a supernova, a star that suddenly... Um, increases greatly in brightness because of a catastrophic explosion that ejects the most of its mass. Thank you for that expression and for that explanation. I love everything everyone said because it's all true. It's all true. But this one, this definition, however, really helps me to hone in on what I'm trying to communicate to you. Okay. A supernova is a star that suddenly increases greatly in brightness. What has the sun been doing lately, family? Has anybody noticed? Has anybody noticed that our sun is real bright? Is Am I the only one who's noticed that? Am I the only one who gets burned going out in the sun these days? And I never got burned before. Am I the only one? White light. Yes. Yes, it is. Yes. Yes, it is. It, you can't ignore it now. It's heating up. It's hot. That's exactly right. It's, it's hotter than hot. Yes. Yes. Safte says, I've noticed it. Yeah. It's hot. So let's go back to sister. Um, if I can find her comment, if I can find it, I hope so. Okay. A supernova is a star that suddenly increases greatly in brightness and luminosity because of a catastrophic explosion that ejects most of its mass. Okay. But before this happens, there are signs of a supernova on, on a planet or excuse me, on a star. 
it begins to expand. It gets bigger. Has anyone noticed how big the sun looks in the sky these days? It gets bigger and it gets hotter. So I'm not saying that our sun is going supernova. If our sun went supernova, everything would be gone. Everybody. Everything and everybody would be gone because it's it's a planet killer for sure. A pl it's a plane killer. We don't live on a planet. We live on a plane. It's a plane killer for sure. If that were to happen to the sun that's in um, our solar system. But what I'm saying is that certain scientists have explored the concept of something called a micronova. And this is when the sun acts in similar, uh, similar fashion, similar pattern of a supernova, but it's a micronova and it happens cyclically and periodically where it, it acts in the fashion of it expands, the, the light gets hotter, it gets whiter, it gets brighter and it explodes, but it doesn't do so to the degree that it destroys everything. It destroys things, but it doesn't destroy everything. And science is now beginning to demonstrate that some of the catastrophes of the past weren't necessarily asteroids destroying, let's say, for instance, the dinosaurs, but the sun going micronova. Okay. So these are things that I'm still looking into that the father's been having me to research and look into. But the author says the sun's heat and its fire makes the elements speed up. Hence the times we're living in is moving fast. You are speaking truth. You are speaking truth. I have been talking to everybody about how everything seems to be speeding up so fast. Like everything is just so fast right now. Everything is moving fast and normal. Repent and live in the word of Yah before the time turn out. Good word, my brother. Such a good word. That is a good word. Hallelujah. Uh, it's just about, okay. Shea butter. Thank you for that tip. Shea butter on the skin. So if you're burning and my skin is dark, so I don't burn, burn, like get a sunburn, but I feel the heat of it. And I never did before like this. So shea butter. Thank you for the tip. Okay. So this article is talking about the discovery of Ben Davidson of what he calls a micronova, where the sun has these periods of time where it's in the midst of a magnetic reversal. And something within the center of the galaxy is also in the midst of a magnetic reversal. Because remember, we talked about electromagnetism being everywhere. It's the force that holds everything together. But within electromagnetism, there are these polar shifts where it goes from north to south and south to north. Our sun is in the midst of that. Our earth is in the midst of that. There's a force in the center of the galaxy that is also in the midst of that. And it is affecting the sun. Okay, so this concept of the solar flash is coming. Um, Shock and Davidson estimated that the micronova event was as much as 40 times the power of the most destructive solar storm observed in modern history. And the 1859 Carrington event is, would be an example for that. So just imagine we're talking about spontaneous igniting of papers and, and fire streaming out of these wires. That was horrible. But this micronova event is even more powerful, 40 times more powerful than the strongest of the Carrington events that you could have and experience. I believe, family, that this is what the Father is describing in the book of Revelation and in other books where it talks about these judgments. When we have the Apostle Sham the Apostle Kaffa say that the, the elements will melt with fervent heat. How does that happen if it doesn't happen by the sun? It's going to happen because it's been written. It's been spoken. The enormous amount of plasma that arrived immediately after the Micronova event circa 9700 BC bombarded the earth producing an effect similar to one or more asteroid impacts. This has caused confusion and led to many um, archaeological, archaeological researchers into mistakenly believing or interpreting the historic evidence as impacts causing or ending the last ice age as deriving from asteroid impact rather than plasma discharges. Plasma from the sun. Plasma. 
When the sun produces a CME, a major one, it produces plasma. It releases plasma. Plasma is destructive at high temperatures and high, um, I can't think of the word right now, but moving quickly, fast, okay? It's destructive. And it can initiate also lightning. So now we're going to talk about scriptures. So I, that was all backstory. I gave you all the backstory. I gave you all the science that I could muster and thank the father because I'm not a scientist. I never took physics in high school or anything like that. So this has just been the father showing me and helping me to understand these things. So now we're going to go to the scripture and we're going to see how the scripture aligns with what we just read. Okay. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal and lo, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as a sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood and the stars fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely fig figs when she's shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island removed out of their places. And the kings of the earth and great men and rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in dens and rocks of mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come and who shall be able to stand? This is the, the events that the sixth seal releases. The sixth seal releases these things. And what we're seeing here is a precursor to the events of the trumpets and the vials, which are the very, they're, they're essentially the same, but they're described a little differently. And we're going to get into that as well. But these events are precursors. These events are like, the coming attractions, as I, as I described it last week, of what is coming and the jump in the judgments that are to come. So what we see here, we see a great earthquake. We see the sun becoming black as sackcloth of hair. And we see the moon becoming blood. Now, remember that report we read or the woman in Sullivan's Island said the sky took on a reddish hue. And that as the water was reflecting the sky, it looked as if the water had turned to blood because it was reflecting the reddish hue from the aurora borealis that had come so far south. So just keep that in mind as you, as you read these things in the scriptures and think of what in terms of science could be happening to cause these things. Okay. But what we also see here are, mar are people, what I believe modern people now, building underground bunkers, building dens and caves of the earth and outfitting them with all the modern conveniences. They got electricity down there. They, they, they have some of the most fancy underground bunkers you ever want to think about. And all these people in Hollywood and all the rich and famous people are building themselves underground bunkers to hide themselves from the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb but there is no pit that they can dig so deep that they can hide from the most high. He is everywhere. You can't run from him. Yes. Yes. Sister Joanda. Yes. Won't save him. It won't. It won't. Um, Abimelech says, then it got dark like it was night and then it became day again. Oh, what is that? I, I think I might've missed part of your comment. The sky turned red, red in New York City. Wow. And then it got dark and it got bright again. Oh my gosh, there are signs all over the place. Wow. Thank you for sharing that, brother. So, and when he had opened the seventh seal, there was a silence in heaven for the space of half an hour. We talked about that last week. And I saw the seven angels which stood before Yahuwah, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came up with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before Yahuwah out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer 
and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it to the earth. And there were thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. So the seventh seal is revealing and unleashing the, everything from the sixth seal because there was a pause so that the father could mark his servants in their forehead. We talked last week about where do we believe we are right now in these events. And many of you said that you believe that we were in that pause. I too believe we're in the pause. We're in the time right now where the father is marking his servants in their foreheads. He's saying, know me, know me. Don't know of me, know me, come to know me, get intimate with me, come into my presence because that's the only way you're gonna be protected in the times that are coming. You need to know me, you need to be intimate with me. You need to obey my commandments. You need to be with people who are of like mind. You need to not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some has become. You need to make sure that you're seeking me that you haven't sought me before. The father is marking his people. One more bit of science before we move on fully into scripture. Did you all know that the sun triggers earthquakes? If you knew that, put a one in the chat. Did you know that? Did you know it's the particles, the charged particles from the sun that hits the earth that causes earthquakes in the direction of where those charged particles were received by the earth? If you knew that, give me one in the chat. Let's see who knew that. Yeah, wow, many of you knew that. Look at this. Many of you knew. Wow, I'm so impressed with y'all. Many of you knew that. Hallelujah. Some of you didn't, but yeah, this the sun triggers so many things in the earth, and we're just not aware of these things. And I started studying this out probably five years ago, and I would look and see. I didn't study them personally. I, I studied the, the people who do study them, and they would demonstrate how there would be a solar flare or a CME or something, and then a few days later, there'd be an earthquake. And then the degree to which there was a powerful CME or solar flare, that would be the degree to which there would be a powerful earthquake. And the connection cannot be denied. You just can't deny the connection. There is one. So this article reads, ground shaking earthquakes occur all across the globe. And according to a new study, many of them might be triggered by the sun. Through decades of research, scientists have learned that large, powerful earthquakes commonly occur in groups, not in random patterns. But exactly why has so far remained a mystery. Now, new research published, published July 13th in Scientific Reports asserts that the first strong, though still disputed, evidence that powerful eruptions on the sun can trigger mass earthquake events on Earth. And indeed it does. To the unaided eye, the sun might seem relatively docile, but our star is constantly bombarding our solar system with vast amounts of energy and particles in the form of the solar wind. We talked about that. Sometimes, however, formidable eruptions on the sun's surface cause coronal mass ejections or spe specifically, pardon me, or essentially energetic floods of particles, including ions and electrons, <clears throat> that careen through the solar system at breakneck speeds. When they reach Earth, these charged particles can interfere with satellites and under extreme circumstances take down power grids. The new research suggests that particles from powerful eruptions like this, specifically the positively charged ions, might be responsible for triggering groups of strong earthquakes. Okay, so this is the article. And I include that, we'll come back to that. I include that to say this, when there is the solar flash that we talked about, this bright, this flash of bright light, I believe that the, the, the flash of light and the release of these particles is what triggers the great earthquake that we just read about. So the sun is triggering it. When the sun does what it's going to do, it triggers this great earthquake that the scripture speaks of. Okay, and this is all judgment from the throne of the Father. 
This is all a part of what he's ordained for this time. But I did want to mention one more thing. I wanted to make one note because I don't think I did a good enough job of demonstrating this on our last um, time together. So I wanted to make sure you know this. Okay, this important note. The four horsemen that we talked about, we talked about them riding against our people and bringing uh, just horrific events to our people. I want to make sure I demonstrate to you that the four horsemen are still in the earth, okay? They have still been riding against our people. You still see the one who went out to conquer and to conquer. You still see that horse riding. You still see war. You still see the red horse riding. You still see the black horse, the scales, deciding who will eat and who will starve, deciding who will be rich and who will be poor, deciding, bringing death. You still see those things happening. You still see the pale horse. You still see famine. You still see all of these horses and their effect in the earth. And you still see them moving, unfortunately, against our people. You still see these things. However, when the father unleashes his judgment, these four horsemen will switch directions. And instead of bringing these things to the Most High's people, they will turn and gallop toward the nations. They will gallop toward the nations. They will bring their horrors to the nations. Those who have conquered others will be conquered. Those who have brought war to others will be invaded. Those who have dealt with unjust balances and scales and caused famine and all men of horror against people and been in control of the riches and wealth of this nation, of the world indeed, for a long time, they will be paupers as the wealth of the wicked is transferred to the just. Those who have brought death and destruction and disease and war and famine and horror to the earth, they will reap as they have sown. And the four horsemen will turn and gallop toward the, the Gentile nations who are being judged by the Most High. I wanted to make sure that I conveyed that. Okay, because when we're reading the seals, we see the seals, we see the four horsemen, and I related to them to our people. But I want you to know they're going to gallop against the nations. Okay, so fear not. Fear not. And I don't believe they're going to gallop against the nations in succession. I believe it's going to be an onslaught as the Most High brings his judgment. So he's going to be bringing judgment against them, not only in terms of famine and war and and um, economic woes and pestilences and plagues, but also fire in the sky, er, 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 volcanic eruptions, natural disasters. They're going to be getting it from every which way but loose. It's going to be horrific because they will not repent. They will not turn from their wickedness and they will not do right by Yaakov. They will not do right by Yaqub. Esau will not repent. He will not, so he will have to face the Father's wrath. So I just wanted to make sure I made that clear, that these four, four horsemen will ride against the nations. Okay? Yes, I believe it did. Chocolate Night too. Yes, I believe that's right. I believe you're right. Okay. In Matthew chapter 24, we see corroborating scriptures to Revelation chapter six. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall far, fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Okay. So immediately after the tribulation of those days, which days? The tribulation of which days? Now, I know you've probably heard a lot, a lot of different answers to this, but immediately after the tribulation of what days? I want you to tell me. I'm going to give you two minutes to put your comments in the chat. Okay? Tell me which days are talking about. Which tribulation is Yahushua talking about there?
Okay, let me scroll through. Okay. Okay, let's see. I agree with that. I agree with that, um, um, Brother Abimelech. I agree with that. Absolutely. Brother Arthur says, when Yahushua returns with his army of angels, picture thousands of 200 foot plus angels trampling the inhabitants of the earth. Yahushua will be over 200 feet tall. And that's why they all will see. I hadn't thought about that. I guess it's possible. That's why they'll all see because he'll be tall. That's very possible, I guess. They will not escape reaping what they've sown. Hallelujah. Glory to the Ancient of Days. Hallelujah. Let's see. Yes, the heavens and the earth will catch fire. Yes, it will. That's what the scripture says, and that's what will happen. Brother L.C. says, the, a whole lot of judgment going on. Egypt was one place. This is a whole earth. That's exactly right. This, what happened in Egypt, even though it happened in other places in the world too at that time, we just didn't hear about it, but it was pretty much localized to that region. This is going to be worldwide. Yes, absolutely right. A play, TC says a plague, an answer to my question. Um, inspired identity says there's destruction of the temple. Yes, sister. Yes, that's part of it for sure. Um, sister Zakia says the tribulation that Yashra experienced. Yes. Uh, sister Yonda said the Gentiles. Uh, Saftaya says, Safte says, Jacob's tribulation. Yes. Brother Yahudin says, the day of the Lord. Um, those horses are already turning towards the nations. What's going over in Niger will be what returns us to our home. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah, because our people over there, they're starting to pull together. Let it happen, Father. Let it happen. Sister Jelen Jelena says, Jacob's troubles. Yes. Lisa Smith says, the tribulation of the latter days, our times. So it's Teeth Neal says, current days. Thank you now says, the, the Gentile or the gentle, Gentile tribulation. Okay, let's see. The end of the Gentile powers. Okay, so I'm seeing, I'm experiencing great tribulation right now. I'm sorry to hear that, beloved. I'm sorry to hear that. Sister Thadrian says, these times that we're experiencing now and have for some time. Yes. So you guys are hitting on it. The tribulation of the days that Yahushua is talking about, I believe, begins with the destruction of the temple, as some of you, um, yes, Sister Lisa, the destruction of the temple that, be, that happened in 70 AD, the Roman Jewish Hebrew war began in 66 AD and lasted to 73 AD. So it was a seven year war, but the temple was destroyed about midway through and 70 AD. From that point on, we were just, we had our no homeland. We lost a lot. We lost a lot, lot. And then went into slavery after that. And now find ourselves in situations where, let me get back to my slides. Okay, just a second. Okay. The destruction of the Jerusalem temple, that was what it began for us. When Yahushua said, your house is left unto you desolate, 40 years after that, the destruction of the temple came. 40 is the number of testing and trial. 40 years after he decreed and declared, that's when it happened. And then shortly after that, a few hundred, a thousand years or so, we had slavery and all manner of horror all over the earth for our people. And then we, after slavery ended in 1860, they tell us you had Jim Crow and lynching and burning crosses and all kinds of horror, discrimination, awfulness. So the suffering didn't end. And then you still got the George Floyds of the world and you've got the Trayvon Martin of the world. So the tribulation of those days, from the destruction of the temple to now. That's what he's talking about. The, the, the tribulation of those days, of the days. So when this event happens, it is what ends our tribulation. It ends it for us. We're going to go back and read that scripture that I had on the screen. It says, and when you shall see Jerusalem compass with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries therein enter, enter into it. 
For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword. Who? Our people. Our people fell by the edge of the sword. The sword in the scriptures means war. We fell by the edge of the sword. The father brought the sword against us, and we were made desolate, and we shall be led away captive into all nations. That's exactly what happened. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And that's what's happening. So we're waiting in hope until the end of the times of the Gentiles. And I do believe that it is like at hand. It is at hand. So immediately after the tribulation of those days. Okay, let's get back to, to the scripture. Those days, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened. So we know, family, we are coming up on the end of the tribulation of those days. So what happens after that? The sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven. So the scripture is telling us that these things are near and at hand. They're near because we are arriving at the end of the tribulation of those days. The Gentiles powers are no longer going to be in power very shortly. And it's during that time that we see these things happening. Okay. And then we shall see the coming of the son of man in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And when he comes, he comes to judge the earth in righteousness and with justice. He comes to judge and he comes to make war. And as he's judging and making war, all of these things are happening in the earth, uh, electrically, electromagnetically, in the heaven signs and wonders. You're seeing these things. You're seeing war. The book of Second Ezra indicates that when Yahushua returns to the earth, the nations will be fighting themselves. So there'll be a world war. There, there are all of these things happening at the same time. It's like the four horsemen just jump onto the scene all at the same time. And there's just all manner of things happening. And we must be watchful and prayerful and don't get ourselves involved in these things because it has nothing to do with us. We're of another nation. It has nothing to do with us. So don't get yourself involved in this in, in their shenanigans. Stand back and behold the salvation of Yahuwah. Hallelujah. Okay, so we're going to talk about the sixth and seventh seals and how it relates to the judgment that we've been talking about so far today. Okay. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's heart failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken and then they shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to come to pass, look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. During these times, and even when we read these scriptures, I never saw how there's so much connection between the two of them, these two in Luke and and. 21 and Matthew 24, but also to the book of Revelation in scriptures in Isaiah chapter 34 and, and 42, I believe. They're, they're, they're saying the same thing in so many different places. And as we read them, we can understand that the end of our troubles, the end of Jacob's trouble comes with cataclysms to the earth. It, it's almost as if it marks the end of Jacob's trouble. Jacob's trouble ends when the father brings trouble to the nations. Our trouble ends when he brings trouble to the nations. Hallelujah. So we can look up. Our redemption does draw nigh. So we're going to see signs though. We'll see signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations, perplexity, the waves of the sea roaring, waves of the sea roaring. There are floods everywhere right now. I, I can't, it, 
it boggles my mind the amount of floods that I see all over the earth right now. While at the same time, there are droughts all over the world. I just, you know it's judgment. You know it's the judgment of the Most High. But these things are just precursors to what's coming. They're just precursors to the horrors that are coming to the nation, to the nations. So we're going to get into a little bit more detail. So just bear with me. Okay, so in the sixth and seventh seal, we see the censer with fire from the altar in heaven being thrown down to the earth. That is what begins the seventh seal judgments. Then we see lightning, we see thunder, we see a great earthquake. Then we see the sun becoming dark and the moon as blood. We see the stars fall to the earth as if shaken by a mighty wind. We see the heavens departing as a scroll and we see the mountains and the islands being moved out of their places. This is describing a pole shift and is describing the micronova that we talked about or the great flash from the sun. This is what these things are describing. This is what they are. It begins with a flash, a flash from the sun, which triggers a CME or a solar flash from the sun. And that then triggers a major earthquake. And from there, from this major earthquake, which should be, if I'm reading the scriptures correctly, should be worldwide. It's going to be a massive earthquake, massive. Everything will be shaken. Oh, that's my last slide. Got to bring these. Okay. And then the sun will go dark and the moon won't give its light. It'll have a reddish hue. So when the sun goes dark, obviously, if there's any light available, it'll make the moon look as if it's reddish in hue. Okay. It'll make it look like that, reddish in hue. And then you'll see, the scripture says, the stars falling to the heavens. Now, I'm going to ask you all the question because I really would like to know what your thoughts are. When the scripture says the stars are falling from the heavens to the earth, what do you see? Do you see them as literal stars falling to the heavens? Do you see them as angels? Because stars in the scriptures are also referred to as angels. Do you see them as meteorites? Do you see them as rocks? What do you see? Tell me what you see when you read the scripture and the stars will fall to the earth. What do you see? Okay. You guys are right on it. Um, Bright of Zion says angels. Sister Shirley says angels. Abimelech says angels. <laughs> Sister Shirley says angels. <laughs> Bernadette says explosions. Okay. that's that, There will be explosions. Okay. Sister Vet says angels. Sister Messenger says angels. Miss the original says angels. Sister Antoinette says angels. Yeah. And hailstones. <laughs> it's interesting because when I read this verse of scripture, I see both. I see the effects of the hailstones, but I also understand that the father says, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. The powers of the heavens. And when you look that word up, I, I looked it up in the Hebrew, it indicated those of the heavenly hosts. That's what it's referring to when it says in the powers of the heavens. So those fallen angels, some of whom were locked away in chains of darkness, but some of whom still inhabited what's called second heaven. Remember when Daniel prayed, and Gabriel came in response to his prayer. And then he said, the prince of Persia withstood me 21 days, meaning I couldn't come from the heavenly realm to see you, Daniel, because I was detained in the heavenly realms by the prince of Persia. They're there in the heavenly realms in the what's called the second heaven. So this seems to be indicating that the father will say, get out of my heaven, get out. 
There's no room any longer found for you here. And we see that in Revelation chapter 12, where Michael fights the dragon and the dragon's tail draws a third part of the stars and cast them to the earth because it says there's no longer any room left for them. The father's like, I'm cleaning house. I'm cleaning my heavens. It said in the book of Job that even the heavens weren't clean before him because he had in the second heavens, those who were contrary to his will, those who were acting in ways that were sinful and debased before him. And so I believe here that he's saying, get out of my heavenly realm, get out, go on. But at the same time, according to what Sister Lily Ray is saying, I also see the idea of hailstones falling like stars. So I believe we're going to see both. I believe we're going to see both. Thank you all for participating. I love it when we can get together and reason together in the scriptures because we need that. Not every person, not every one person has got all the understanding. So the father works in all of us to bring about his desired ends. So, and then I've got a crack right here in the screen, but not my screen, but I've got a crack in the heavens. So the scripture also says that the firmament, oh, I just gave it away. Sorry. <laughs> It says that the heavens, forget I didn't say that, the, the heavens <clears throat> shall roll away as a scroll. That's what it says, okay? So how does that happen? How does the heavens just roll away? Well, and then it says the islands will be moved out of the places as well. But how does that happen? In Yahshua Yahu, Isaiah chapter 34, it reads, For the indignation of Yahuwah is upon all nations and his fury upon all armies. He hath utterly destroyed them and hath delivered them to the slaughter. Their slain also shall be cast out and their stink shall come up of their carcasses and the mountain shall be melted with their blood and all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved. There it is right there. The, the idea of the host of heaven is referring to the stars of heaven. The angels were called stars. Okay, they will be dissolved, meaning I believe they'll either be destroyed or they'll be booted out and the heaven shall be rolled together as a scroll because there's no longer room found for any wickedness in the heavenly realms anymore. So he's saying you're evicted, get out. And then he's going to roll the heavens up as a scroll. And it says, and all their host shall fall down as the leaf falleth from the vine and as a falling fig from the fig tree. So Isaiah, Yahshua, Yahu, chapter 34, specifically and very beautifully tells us that the father is ridding the, the second heaven of all those angelic hosts who hang out there, who make that place their abode. And also of Hasatan, who day and night accused um, us before the father, day and night, all the time, constantly accusing us before the father. He too will be booted out. Okay, and the scripture is referring the, to the host of heaven as falling down as a leaf falleth from a vine. So it's a, just a beautiful picture of what we're being told in the book of Matthew as well. But the heaven, it says, shall be rolled together as a scroll. And so we have up, upstairs, of course, in the heavenly realms, a firmament. It's a firm made of rock dome over the earth and it's strong, it's strong. You've had people of other nations trying to shoot missiles up into it, trying to break it and crack it so that they can get out of Dodge and escape the judgment that's coming and they have not been able to get out of Dodge, okay? So this firmament that's above us, it's, it's solid, it ain't going nowhere. But the father says he's gonna roll it like a scroll. The vault or expanse of the heavens is the firmament. It's the sky or the heavens. And when you read in Genesis or Barashith chapter one, verses six through eight, where we learn that Yahuwah said, let there be a firmament, a rahia, in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Waters in Hebrew is ma'in. Let it divide the waters from the waters. And Yahuwah made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And Yahuwah called the firmament heaven. So heaven is the firmament. 
the firmament is heaven. So when the father rolls up heaven, he's rolling up the firmament. He's getting rid of the firmament. Okay, that's what the scripture is telling us. He's getting rid of the firmament, but the firmament is solid. How does he do that? Well, he's Yahuwah. He can do whatever he wants, however he wants it. He could just speak to it. He could take it, just like we see a picture right here of a scroll on the screen, and he could just roll it up. You see how the scroll has been rolled up? Imagine the scroll that's on the table that's, that's rolled out. Imagine it draped over the earth like a tent. That's how the scripture describes the firmament. Like it's draped over the earth like a tent. And imagine taking that scroll and just flipping it over and rolling it up. Just like the one that's on the screen right there already rolled up. This is the imagery that we're seeing. That the firmament is going. It's either going to be blasted or it's going to be rolled up in some way. Now if it's blasted, that rock has to go somewhere. That means it's going to fall to earth. So could it be that when the angels are being, the fallen angels are being booted out of the heavenly realms and being sent into the earth realm and there are things falling to the earth, could it be that it's part of the chunks and pieces of the firmament that come down with it? Stephanie said meteors to when she gave her answer. Could it be that what we see is meteors or stars falling from the sky? Could it be? Spiritually speaking, these angelic hosts that have been kicked out of the heavenly realms and the firmament, which has been broken and cracked, is now falling down to the earth. It's very possible. It's very possible that we're seeing the stars, the angels come down, and we're seeing the cracks of the firmament, as the Father says, that's it. And he gets rid of it, and now you can see the image of his light, of his brilliance, sitting on his throne. And the nation say, hide us. Hide us from the face of the one sitting upon the throne. Hide us. They can't even stand to see the light of his countenance. It's too much for them. They can't. They're too wicked. And his, the light of his countenance exposes every wicked deed, every wicked thought. And they can't handle it. They want to dig holes in the earth and say, hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne. Hide us. But you can't hide. You can't hide from him. He sees it all. Hallelujah. There's another image here on the screen of what I was talking about, of taking like a shade and just rolling it up. It could be like that, or it could be as I described before. Since the firmament is firm, it's like rock, it could just be cracked and have it all just fall down to the earth. And what it will look like meteorites at the same time that the fallen will be coming down as well. So here's an image of what it looks like. We have we see this the earth such as it is. It's it's flat relatively and then we see the waters above the firmament and the waters below the firmament and we see that the firmament is also called the sky and the heavens. And so it's draped over like a tent. And the father could roll it up or he could just crack it and cause all the pieces to just come raining down. Okay? All right, so we've already discussed that. So, we can, so we're going to get um, now to the trumpets. And we're going to read the trumpet judgments. I, was, I, I went over and over about how to do this because I did tell you that the trumpets and the vials are essentially linked because the seals decree, the trumpets declare, and the, the bowls or the vials manifest. That's what we're seeing in the three. That's what we discussed last week. So I was like, how can I best demonstrate this to you if I just do the trumpets and then I don't do the bowls? So I'm going to do, I'm going to do four bolt, four, um, excuse me, trumpets and bowls today because five, six, and seven are massive. There's so much information that I have to convey in those. I'm going to let those be their own separate lesson. So today we're going to go over the first four trumpets and their corresponding vials or bowls, okay? The first angel sounded. And there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burnt up, and all the green grass was burnt up. At the same time, we see the vial saying, and the first went, and he poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon men, which had the mark of the beast, 
and upon them that worshiped his image. So how do these two go together, the first trumpet and the first vial? Well, we see hail and fire being poured out onto the earth. And in the second, excuse me, on the, on the vial, we see something being poured out. It doesn't say what it is, okay? But the trumpet is decreeing that it's hail and fire. The vial is indicating that the hail and fire being poured out caused noisome and grievous sores. Do you see that, brothers and sisters? The trumpet declared hail and fire mingled with blood being poured out into the earth. The vial says this is what happened. When the vial was poured out, a noisome and grievous sore appeared upon men which had the mark of the beast. So the fire and the hail brought the sores because they were being hit not only with sores, but also with solar particles and all manner of things that are coming from the heavenly realms at that time. And it says the third part of the trees was burnt up in all green grass. Trees in the scriptures. When you see the scripture talks about trees in such a way, not every instance, but in many of them, especially when it's speaking prophetically, trees and grass refer to humanity, people, trees and grass. So it's saying the third part of trees was burnt up and all green grass was burnt up. But it says the third part. And we've talked about this before, but we're going to have to talk about it again, about what this third part means. Okay. So we're just going to look at this image of all of this falling down to the heavenly realms, excuse me, from the heavenly realms to the earth. And it's hail and fire mingled with blood. What does it mean that the hail and the fire was mingled with blood. Does that mean that blood was literally falling from the sky? Is that what it means? Did the father literally pour blood from the sky? Is that something that he would do? This is symbolic language. And the symbolic language is indicating that whatever's falling from the heavens will draw blood. It's blood inducing, meaning it's going to cause people to lose their lives. So whatever is mingled with blood such as it is in a judgment, is that which draws blood, causes blood flow, causes death. So the scripture is telling us that the hail and the fire is mingled with blood, meaning it's going to cause people to die. And these things were cast upon the earth and the third part of the trees were burnt up, meaning they were destroyed. They lost their lives, okay? This is what it's telling us. And those specifically who worshiped the mark of the beast were, were, were given noisome and grievous sores upon their bodies. Okay. Noisome and grievous sores. Those who mark, who worship the beast. We're going to get to that in just a, a little bit. We're going to get to talk about the beast a little bit more. Okay. So once again, the imagery of grass and trees refers to people. So people are being destroyed in the third part. We also see hailstones falling to the earth, affecting the whole earth. But specifically, the scripture is mentioning the third part. Okay, so before I get to the, this question, I'm going to ask you a question. I have discussed the third part before. Rocky Balboa says, what is all green grass? It's, it's when I looked up the word all, because I wanted to know whether or not it was saying all it means all of a particular kind. It means of, of whatever the thing is being named, whatever it is, all of that thing. So if you said, I ate all the M&Ms, if that's what you said, you just, you walked into the room and you said, I ate all the M&Ms. Am I to believe that you ate all the M&Ms in the whole world? No. What you're saying is I ate all the M&Ms of all the M&Ms that I had in my possession. So what this is saying is, of all the green grass that meet the criteria that's being set forth right here for this judgment, that green grass was burnt up. That's what it's saying. It's saying all of a particular kind. Okay. There's a criteria that's being set here. So thank you for the question, brother Rocky. Okay. So question. I have talked about it before and I want to see if you remember, or many of you may know because you're very studious. What is the third part. Okay. What is the third part? 
What is the third part? Yes, but Sister Beverly, I don't think it's monkeypox. I think it's the sun burning people. Yes, absolutely. I think it's going to be the sun. It's going to be really bad. So what's the third part? If you don't know, you don't, you don't have to, you know, guess. But if you know, I want you to drop in the in the chat. What is the third part? Because the scripture references the third part in the book of Revelation a lot. What is it? I have discussed it before. I have discussed it in the Revelation chapter 17 series. So if you've watched that, you probably know. Um, not the fourth part, brother Calvin, the third part. The third part, not the fourth part. Yes, bread for Zion. Japheth's land. <clears throat> yes, Europe. Yes, that is the third part. Yes, yes, yes. That's it. Hallelujah. Yes. Europe. Yes. Yes, Sister Shayla. Yes. It's Japheth's land. Yes, Sister Regina. Brother Kenneth, that's exactly what it is. Yes. So whenever you see the scripture in the book of Revelation referring to the third part, it's not telling you that the father's only going to burn up a third of the trees. That's not what it's saying. That's simplistic thinking. Trees are referencing people. And a third part is represent, representing a location. He's telling you that the whole world is going to be judged, but it's going to be really bad in the third part. It's going to be really bad in the third part. Yes, yes, in the Isles of the Gentiles. Exactly right. Europa, yes. Yes, Sister Jennifer, Europe. Yefes land. That's it. Yes, yes, yes. So in the third part, this is where we're seeing this happening let me correct myself. It's happening all over, but it's really going to happen real bad in the third part. Okay. In the third part of the earth. All right. So I have another question for you. I know you all love answering questions. So I got another question for you. It's on the screen. Where's the seat of the beast? Where is the seat of the beast? And I'll take a sip of my tea while you all answer. That's a good answer, Brother Rocky. That's a good answer. That's a really good answer. But it was transferred. And Brother Calvin's got it right here. There it is. There it is. Sister Antoinette, yes. Brother Bimina, yes. Yes. That's it. It was in Turkey, but now it's here. It's in Rome. Yes. Then yeah, that Chocolate Night 2 got even more specific. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Yes. There it is right there. It's the third part. <laughs> That's a great answer, Adalia. That's it. It's the third part. The seat of the beast is the third part. That's exactly right. Oh, you all. I love you guys. <laughs> That's exactly right. It's the third part. <laughs> Mr. The original, he gave me both. Absolutely right. That's it. That's the seat of the beast. Okay. So thank you. I wanted you to answer that question before we continue on, because I want you to be thinking about this as we continue on, as the Most High tells us about these judgments that are coming. Okay. And then now you understand a little bit better why these things are affecting the third part so specifically. Think about that. Think about why it's affecting the third part, the seat of the beast, like it is. There's a particular judgment for this part of the world. Okay, so here's an image on the screen for those of you who haven't seen it. It's the, the inheritance of the land as it was divided up. And this is just um, a rendering of it. We don't have a specific official map, but this is a rendering. It's an old map. I don't remember the year on it, but it's an older map that gives an, us, gives us an idea of how the land was separated. Part of Africa and Asia, part of Asia went to Shem, and then Yafet got Europe, and then Hum... Ham or Ham got part of the African region as well. Shem got two portions because he got the double blessing. He got the double portion. So he got half of the world and the other two shared a quarter. Shem's land is the first world or the first part. And Africa was the second part. 
in Europa was the third part, but there's another part that wasn't accounted for over in the Americas called the fourth part, but we don't need to talk about that right now. Okay. So the third part is in Rome. It's in Europe. In Rome is in terms of a headquarters, but specifically, excuse me, specifically, but in general, Europe. So we see Europe being targeted for a lot of this stuff. It's being targeted because it possesses the seat of the beast. Another question for you all. What is the religion of the beast system? What is the religion of the beast system? Because it has one. Remember, the rider of the white horse presented himself as being someone who was peace loving. He went forth to conquer. Remember, he conquered under a particular doctrine of discovery. Oh gosh, you guys are all over it. Look at this. You guys are all over it. Yes. Christianity. Catholicism, Christianity is the religion of the beast system. Absolutely right. Absolutely. I love you all. This is wonderful. The Catholic Church and Christianity. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think I have another question for you. Okay. What image? Oh, I have a, a typo. Please forgive my typo. I was up all night working on these slides, you guys. <laughs> all night. I think I went to sleep at like 7 a.m. So please forgive my typo. I do not like typos, but please forgive it. What image represents the, re the religion? Oh, I'm sorry. I don't have a typo. For forgive me. What is the image that represents that religion best? I thought that was saying beast. What is the image that represents that religion best? What image? The religion that you just discussed, the religion of Christianity, what image represents it best? Now, I knew a lot of you were going to say the cross. I knew it. I knew you were going to say the cross. And it does. But is that the best image that represents religion? There it is. There it is. There it is right there. There it is right there. That is what it is. And it's not as if our Messiah represents a false religion, but our Messiah, his name is not Jesus and he's not white. He, it's just, they just completely took our Messiah and turned him into something else so that they could elevate him above the father and turn him into an idol. That's what they did. So Rome is the seat of the beast where you have Catholicism there in Rome. You have the Vatican there and you have the fake religion there. That's the religion of the beast system. And then you have the image of the beast, the image of the beast. And note that these are the areas that are being particularly hard hit. Okay. You see the father is strategic. He is strategic in his judgment. He is so brilliant. So let's continue on. Thank you all for answering these questions for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, Sister Shayla. He copies Yahuwah and everything. Absolutely right. He absolutely does. Okay, so let's continue on. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood, and the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. Note this consistent third part, third part, third part. This is telling you that the judgments are falling upon the whole earth, but this particular part of the world is being hard hit. And I'm not going to give America a pass because America is included in this third part. Why? Because of the doctrine of discovery. Those from the third part went into the Americas and took it over. So they too are part of the third part and they don't get a pass. So when you see these things referring to Yafet's land, to the third part in Europe, also translate them to the Americas because the Americas were colonized from people of the third part. Okay. All right. So that was the second um, trumpet. The second vial says, and the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea and it became as the blood of a dead man and every living soul in the sea died. Okay. So we have here a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. 
and a third part of the sea became blood. So the imagery here we just discussed, when the waters are becoming blood or becoming like blood is an indication that all those who are being affected by this particular judgment, maybe not all, but some of a particular kind who meet a particular criteria are losing their lives. And that's why the sea is turning to blood because people are losing their lives as a result of this great mountain burning with fire. And the third part of the creatures in the sea, in the third part, creatures in the sea in the third part, and they had life, they died. Which in the third part, you had ships that were destroyed. Remember, the, the genesis almost of the shipbuilding in Europe was headquartered in a particular place between Spain and Portugal, okay? They were big on shipbuilding. It's a very heavy Edomite area. These places are being hit by these judgments that the father is bringing. At the same time, the vial is pouring out the judgments of the, of the second trumpet. And we see the sea also becoming blood. You see the consistency between the vials and the trumpets becoming blood on the second trumpet, becoming blood and the vial. They're consistent. Okay. And so it says, but it become, but became blood as the blood of a dead man. And the blood of a dead man, that's going to be thick. Maybe even, maybe even it's not even red anymore. Maybe it's brown now because it's just so old and so decayed. So this is an indication of a widespread, a widespread loss of life. Widespread. It says every living soul in the sea died. Now, I don't know if that's absolutely literal or not. It could be, it could not. I don't know. But if it's not literal, a lot of people and things are dying. A lot. Okay. It's either all or a lot. So this is what this is telling us. Now this mountain, the burning with fire that comes onto the earth. What do you think it is? What do you think this mountain burns like, like it's burning with fire? What do you think it is? Oh, Bernadette, thank you for that. Oh, where's, where'd your comment go? There it is. The blood of a dead man is brown. I'm a makeup artist for the dead. Oh, wow. Wow, that's interesting. I, I just imagined that. But yeah, thank you for confirming that. Thank you for confirming that. And can you imagine, just symbolically speaking, there being so much bloodshed in an area that the rivers and the streams and the and the oceans are filled with blood that's turned brown because it's got so much widespread blood flow and, and loss of life. That's just, ooh. thank you for sharing that. And yet, and sister um, messenger said, dead man's blood stinks. I imagine that it did. And that was going to come out of my mouth, but I didn't know because I've never experienced it. But thank you for confirming that as well. Thank you. Okay. And also, yes, Joanda, that's a really great point. The Marine Kingdom also. So maybe there's some, some destruction going on there where the father's destroying and dealing with the Marine Kingdom. Great point. Great point, sister. Great point. Okay, let's go back to the question that I asked. Let's see. Okay, Chocolate Knight said volcanoes. Sister Jen said volcanoes. Sweet Lady said Wormwood. You're getting a little ahead of us. Wormwood's the next one. Um, worm, worm was the next one. Rocky Balboa said a meteorite. Uh, Sister Kathy said Messiah. Oh, Sister Kathy said Messiah. Um, aren't meteors in fire? Yeah. This, but think about this. This is saying it's like a mountain. It's like a mountain. What's similar to them? What's similar to a meteorite, but tends to be massive that comes down from the skies and hits, hits the waters or hits the earth. What is it? Think about it. It's like a mountain though. It's not just like a meteorite, like your standard meteorite. It's huge. It's massive. What astronomical or astrological feature, astronomical feature comes down to the earth at times that looks like fire streaking through the sky. That's huge. Yes, there it is. There it is right there. An asteroid. I believe that's what we're seeing here. An asteroid. Yes, an asteroid. It's huge. 
It's not like a meteorite. Asteroids are massive. They can be like as big as continents, huge. So what it says is the second angel sounded and as it were a great mountain. It's being described as being huge, burning with fire. It's burning with fire because it's streaking through the sky as it hits the earth, okay? It hits the earth. Where does it hit? Where does it hit? In the waters near the third part. That's where it's hitting. The father is giving us all this information. And if we have eyes to see, we can see what he's telling us here. Okay. So let's move on. So we have this idea of an asteroid hitting. That would be the Atlantic Ocean. The Atlantic Ocean, somewhere between the mid to the northern Atlantic and causing widespread devastation. Now, what's that going to bring? What's that going to bring when a huge asteroid hits the Atlantic Ocean? It's going to be a tsunami like we've never known. And I've, I've also had dreams about this as well. And others have as well. Huge, massive tsunami. Huge. Okay? Yes, Antonio. Yes, Brother Antonio. Yes. Tsunami. Yes. Tsunami. You guys are on it. Hallelujah. Okay, let's go to the next verse. Well, yeah, we've seen de dead things dying, dead fish, dead things in the waters. And I've already indicated to you that became blood indicates a loss of life of man, animal, or plant, or whatever it is that's being affected. And the reddish hue to the waters, it could be due to dust that's falling from the earth. That's another indication that the reddish waters could be that there is like an iron oxide dust that's falling from the heavenly realms and that that could be turning the waters a reddish hue as well. So th those are the two factors, okay? So one symbolic and one actual, actually physical iron oxide dust turning the waters red. Continuing. The third angel sounded and there fell a great star from heaven burning as it were a lamp and it fell and upon it fell the third part of rivers and upon the fountains of waters and the name of the star is called wormwood and the third part of the waters became wormwood and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter okay this is the third trumpet so what we see here is a great star now remember what we just read regarding the asteroid, it was being described as a great mountain, meaning a, a large body of rock. This is being described as a great star, not a great rock. So is it possible that Wormwood could be a fallen angel? Now we're going to read more about this when we talk about the fifth trumpet because it's, there's going to be more information that's going to be granted to us in the fifth trumpet regarding Wormwood. But right off the bat, if you think about it, it's being described here as a great star from heaven. And we just discussed that when the stars fell from heaven, they were likely meteorites and or fallen angels. Okay. So just keep that in your mind. It fell upon the third part of the river. So once again, we see Europe, and I'm going to say the Americas too, because uh, the Americas is a colony of Europe. Okay. And they came in and took land that did not belong to them. And they also, it fell upon the fountains of waters and the name of the star was Wormwood. And the waters became Wormwood and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. This idea of Wormwood is an idea of bitterness, of sorrow, of woe, of judgment. So let's imagine that this is what the star looks like as it's falling to the, from the sky to the heavenly realms and it falls to the earth and hits the waters and turns the waters bitter. And um, learnreligions.com, we read that wormwood in the Bible uh, defines wormwood as any of the several species of a shrub-like plant in the genus of Artemisia known for its bitter taste. The Bible references to wormwood are metaphors for bitterness, death, injustice, sorrow, and warnings of judgment. Like a bitter pill to swallow, wormwood is also used in the Bible to symbolize Yahuwah's punishment for sin. Although wormwood is not deadly, 
It is often associated with the Hebrew word translated as gall, a poisonous and equally bitter plant. So the idea of being given wormwood to drink is the equivalent of being given gall to drink, which is bitterness, suffering, sorrow, judgment, death. Note, Yahusha, as he hung, giving his life for his nation, was given gall to drink, bitterness. He drank of bitterness, bitterness for us. He did that for us. So the father is going to cause the nations to drink of this bitterness, of this judgment, of the sorrow, and of this, this death. He's going to do that. And this is being symbolized in the idea of wormwood hitting the waterways. Okay. Wormwood is a non-poisonous plant that grows commonly in the Middle East because of its strong, bitter taste. Wormwood in the scriptures is an analogy for bitterness, punishment, and sorrow. Although wormwood itself is not poisonous, its extremely unpalatable taste evokes death and grief. And this is the idea of what's being poured into the waters. And the father's going to cause every man to drink it. He's saying, you mistreated my people. You took advantage of them. Now I'm going to give you the bitterness that I gave them. I'm going to give it to you to drink. The four horsemen that rode against them are now going to ride against you. The ways in which you treated and enslaved them, I'm going to bring it to you. You're going to drink from the cup that I made them drink from. And you're going to drink it down to the dregs. Hallelujah. And the third angel poured out his vial. This is the third vial judgment. Third vial or bowl. The third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and the fountains of water. Same thing. We see the trumpet pouring water on the vials or the or wormwood falling onto the rivers and the waterways. Same thing. We see the third angel manifesting the trumpet's de declaration and pouring out vials on the rivers and fountains of waters and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water say, thou art righteous, O Yahuwah, which art wast and shalt be because thou hast judged thus for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets and thou hast given them blood to drink for they are worthy they're being given the blood and the gall of bitterness to drink they are worthy to be recompensed for what they poured out unto the most high's people so this is pretty consistent with what we see on the imagery of wormwood wormwood is going to be reckoned again. We're going to see it again in the scriptures, like I said, in I believe the fifth trumpet. And so that's going to be our next lesson because there, there's a lot to all of this. And I've already started researching uh, for the fifth trumpet and there's there's a lot there. And this wormwood link is, I think, is bigger than, than I originally understood before I started looking into these things and the father started showing me these things. So this is in direct proportion to the judgment uh, that they issued out on the people of the Most High, they're going to receive it. They're going to be drinking from this bitter cup, this bitter cup, this cup of gall, this cup of blood. So here's just an image of the waterways being poisoned with blood. And the fourth angel sounded. And the third part, once again, we're still in this particular area. We're focused. The whole world is experiencing it, but this part of the world is getting it worse. The third part of the sun was smitten, the third part of the moon, the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them were darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a, a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. Woe, woe, woe indeed. Okay, so the fourth angel is sounding his trumpet and we see the third part of the sun, the third part of the moon and the third part of the stars. Now, if we were to take this literally, we would have to believe that only a third of the sun was shining, only a third of the moon and only a third of the stars were shining. And that doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't, it doesn't follow. It doesn't make any sense to me. But what I'm seeing here is also this indication of the third part. So once again, when the sun starts to go dark, and it will be a process, it's going to be focused in the third part of the earth first. They're going to experience it 
first before anybody else, because that's where the seat of the beast is. And in the fifth trumpet, I believe the most high said darkness is in the seat of the beast. Okay. So it comes there first. So in the third part, we see the sun smitten to the degree that it brings darkness there first so that the sun doesn't shine for part of the day or the night do they have any light first. Okay. Now this is happening at the fourth trumpet. Darkness comes at the fifth trumpet, but with the fifth trumpet, darkness comes with demonic creatures as well. And we're going to get into that when we talk about the fifth trumpet, but here we see darkness coming because the sun's been smitten with something. The sun, the moon, and the stars have been smitten. And what it's doing is it's causing them to become darkened. It's causing them to become obfuscated. They're being weighed down with something so that they can't give their light. Okay. We're going to talk more about that um, as well. This is an image of what that might look like. Clouds and darkness where this is moving into the area of the third part. And this is the... What was that that I just read? Just a second. Okay. Okay. Let's go on to the next little slide. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of Yahuwah, which hath power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. So this is the fourth vial. And when the angel poured out what was decreed and declared by the trumpets upon the sun, power was given to the sun to scorch men with fire. So something happened to the sun to cause it to release and go dark and, and get dark. If it's being obfuscated by dust, by rocks, by something where the light just isn't able to come through. But as it's doing that or before it does that, it scorches people, some men, women, children, and the whole world, but headquartered in, this, in the third part with fire. And it scorches them with great heat. So the sun is undergoing something pretty traumatic right now. It's giving off solar particles to the degree that it's causing people probably in their homes to be scorched. Now, remember, when we read about the Carrington event, people saw spontaneous combustion of paper. Remember, remember we read about that. People saw electrical lines. Well, they weren't electrical. They didn't have electricity, but they saw telegraph lines having streams of fire pouring out of them, just sitting there. So this was indicating something was happening with the sun. It sounds like a massive coronal mass ejection or a huge solar X flare, something's happening where the sun releases a huge amount of, of energetic particles toward the earth and it burns people, likely in their homes. Even maybe if they're hiding under the earth, maybe they get burned. I don't know. But this is affecting specifically those who are part of the beast system, whose tentacles spread in a lot of different places. But the Scriptures are referring to them as those of the third part, okay? And then they get scorched with fire. They get burned. And still, they blaspheme the name of Yahuwah. They will not repent. They will not give him glory. He has power over these things, which the scripture is calling plagues. And they will not repent and turn and give him the glory. They will not. They are stubborn and they are wicked. Going back to Matthew chapter 24. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from the heavens and the powers of heaven shall be shaken and then shall appear the sun, the sign of the sun of man in heaven. And then all shall see and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall all see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So when I read this verse of scripture after going through what we've gone through so far, to me, the clarity is just there. It just feels so much more clear. I feel like I understand better what's being communicated after really comparing and contrasting it with the book of Revelation um, and the trumpet judgments and the vials as well. 
So we're being told a sequence of events that's going to happen. And so what I believe we're waiting for now is we're waiting for that flash. We're waiting for the sun to do its thing and it's going to knock out power. It's going to knock out power all over the world. And this isn't the darkness that that's being prophesied. This is something that happens before that. Okay. In Joel chapter two, we also read, blow ye the trumpets in, in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain, my Kadash mountain. And let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of Yahuwah cometh, for it is nigh at hand, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains are great people and strong. There hath not been ever the light. Neither shall there be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. So we blow the trumpet in Zion as we prepare in advance for the judgments that are coming to this earth. We prepare by getting on our faces before the Father, seeking his face and allowing him to seal us so that we are protected during these troublesome times. This is a verse of scripture in the book of Psalm chapter 18. And as I was reading it, I saw in it the trumpets and I saw the, the seals in this verse of scripture. So I'll read it and you tell me if you see what I saw as I was reading it. And so I'm going to begin at verse four. It says, the arrows of death encompassed, compassed me and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid and the sorrows of hell compassed me about, the snares of death prevented me. So here I'm seeing the first through the fourth seals coming against our people. The floods of ungodly men made us afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed us. We had slavery. We had disenfranchisement. We had Jim Crow. We had all these things coming against us. We had the destruction of our homeland, desolations. This is representative of the first through the fourth uh, seals, the four horsemen, which were riding against us. And then in verse six, in my distress, I called upon Yahuwah and cried unto my Elua, and he heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him even to his ears. This is representative of the fifth seal, where the souls under the altar, in the grave, they're crying unto Yahuwah for justice and for vengeance, and he hears them. He hears them. He hears their crying and their tears. And verse 7, and then the earth shook and trembled, and the foundations also of the hills were moved and were shaken because he was wroth. This is the sixth and seventh um, seal as we see the father shaking the earth, shaking the foundation of the earth and moving on behalf of the children of Yasharal who were crying out from under the grave for justice. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire came out of his mouth and devoured. Coals were kindled by it. Now we're beginning to see the trumpet judgments. So this is what I saw as I was reading this. I saw all of it being demonstrated just in this one psalm. He bowed the heavens also and came down and darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the sky. At the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed hailstones and coals of fire, more trumpet judgments here. Yahuwah also thundered in the heavens and the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire, more trumpet judgments. Yea, he sent out, out his arrows and scattered them and shot out lightnings and discomfited them. Then the channels of waters were seen and the foundation of the world were discovered at thy rebuke, O Yahuwah, at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils. He sent from above and took me and drew me out of many waters. There's our gathering. <laughs> Hallelujah. There's our gathering. He sent from above and took us and drew us out of many waters. Waters in the scriptures represents people, people groups. He drew us out of many waters because we're scattered all over the world. He drew us out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from them which hated me, for they were too strong for me. Hallelujah. 
They prevented me in the day of my calamity, but Yahuwah was my stay. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So this is in Psalm Tehillim chapter 18, a picture of the trumpet judgments, the vile judgments, the bold judgments, and the seals all represented as it relates to us, our judgment, the judgment of the nations, and then our gathering home. And when I read that, I just had to include it in this lesson because it's such an encouragement to us to know that at the end of this, the father is going to gather his elect and bring them back into their rightful place, into their homeland. And that is what we're looking forward to. So as the trumpets sound, don't fear, brothers and sisters. Don't fear. Don't fear. Seek the Father. Stay in his presence. Rest in his presence. And allow him to seal you with the knowledge of himself. Allow him to transform you into the image of his son. And if you are in right standing with the Father, you need not fear what is coming to the earth. You need not fear. Seek the Father's face. And when the things of the things and the things are falling down from the sky and when the demonic is rampant in the earth and all those things that are coming, you will be confident in the power of the Father that is at work in you. Greater is he, greater is he who lives in you than he who lives in the world. Greater, so much greater. So fear not the things that are coming. Just prepare yourselves, prepare your heart, prepare your minds and your souls so that you can be ready to be drawn up out of many waters and be brought home. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So as I stated before, we have three more trumpets to get to, but I'm not going to be able to get to it today because it's going to take it's going to take some time to get through it because there's a lot of different elements to those additional three trumpets and and vials. So I will do that, Yahoo willing on next week. And um, we'll be live again and We'll bring that forth as the Father sees fit. And I just want to thank all of you for being here today and for providing your comments in the comment section. It's just so valuable to have you drop in scriptures and answering questions and enriching the discussion. And I just love it. And I'm just really grateful and thankful to the Father for what he has given to us here and how he's helping us understand the things that are coming. So, for Tuesday's lesson, I won't be doing a sunrise manna or a, any of the other things that I have been doing on Tuesdays. I'm going to be releasing a video on Tuesday that's going to be a little bit of an addendum to this video. So there are videos, there are people who are talking about some of the things that I'm talking about from a scientific perspective regarding the things that are coming to the earth. And I'm going to release a video on Tuesday and it's going to have more details about those things. It's going to show images about those things. It's going to show when the sun goes dark. It's going to show the explosions. It's going to show a lot in that video that's coming, okay? So be on the lookout for that video being released on Tuesday, and then it'll help to enrich this discussion. Um, I did not want to include that here because it would add another 30 to 40 minutes to the lesson time. So, but that's going to come out on Tuesday. Then it's something that you can have separate and apart from this video. So if you feel like you want to, you know, send it to a friend or share it in any way, it's only like a 35 minute video as opposed to sending them the video that's three hours long. You know, they're going to be more likely to want to watch a 30 minute video than a three hour video. So that's just going to give an overview of the things that we've discussed here. And there's scientific you know, implications and ramifications um, from a scientific perspective, but it's all scripture and we've gone over it today. So prayerfully, when you watch that video, you'll be able to see the scripture as it corroborates what you're seeing on the screen. So I pray that's about a call to you that comes out on Tuesday on the channel. And I pray that you got something from this lesson. I've been praying and praying through for the father to just speak because this is really outside of my comfort zone <laughs> For sure. He keeps pressing me and, and pushing me and causing me to go into areas where I feel like, oh, Father, I'm not qualified. And then he reminds me, it's not about me. It's about him. It's about him. There's nothing that he can't do. He, all he needs is a willing vessel. He can do anything but fail. So Yahuwah be praised. Um, I pray that 
this was a baracat to you. So, uh, yeah. oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it, um, any, if you decide to give wonderful, to me, your presence is a gift. So I really appreciate you being here. I appreciate you um, participating. I appreciate answering the questions and thinking about my mama. <laughs> I just, that's to me, that's love. So I just, I thank you all for, um, for just being here. I thank you all for your love and for your, for your, for your compassion and for your kindness. This, it's a beautiful thing. I know that in some areas of our awakening right now, it's a little challenging because there's a lot of disagreement and a lot of debate. And I don't like that stuff. I stay away from it. I keep my head down because I don't want to fight with anybody. I feel like we're family. We need to act like family. So when you all come here and you're all loving and kind to one another and you treat one another so well, it just makes my heart happy. I kind of feel like a proud mama. So I just want to commend you all. And I want to ask you to please keep doing it. And when you go on other channels, if you see people um, being rude to others or just being thoughtless or debating and all that, just, just spread some love. I mean, don't, you know, don't make it worse by pouring gasoline on a fire, but just pour some love and, and just let, and see if that'll help. Cause you know, love covers a multitude of sins. So pour some love, you know, take some, some love that you present here in this chat and spread it around some of the other chats. And perhaps we can create a better environment in the awakening of just love and patience for one another. You know, sometimes people come in the chat and they say, well, you teach this. Another ministry teaches this. And I say, my response is, they could be right. They, they could be right. There is never going to be a time when I'm probably going to want to debate anybody about anything because the father could just be showing us different perspectives for the same thing. So why, why are we going to argue about it? It's just not worth it. You're my brother. You're my sister. I don't want to lose you. It's just not worth it. So with all that said, I just want to thank you for being here. I want to thank you all for just being very supportive. And I appreciate you very much, very much. So we're going to end for today. And I'm going to freshen up my tea and um, just spend some time in the Father's presence. Maybe go out in the sun for a few minutes <laughs> before I have to come back in. Because it looks, it looks nice, but it looks hot out there. So thank you all. Thank you all so much. Thank you all so much. So um, I hope you'll join me um, next week, y'all willing, for the last three trumpets slash vials, and then we'll see what the Father wants to do from there. I just try to be led, and I let him tell me what to do because I don't know anything on my own. I just wanted to be clear about that. I am not brilliant. I'm not all that. I'm, I'm nothing on my own. And if I know anything, it's only because he allows me to know. Okay, so I love you and I really appreciate your kindness. But please know that if you're impressed by anything you hear here, please give glory to the Father. Give glory to the Father. He's the one who's worthy of it. I'm merely a mouthpiece. That's all I am. He's everything. So give glory to the Father. He's more than worthy of it. Okay, I just wanted to put that out there. Much love to you all, and I just pray that the Father would give you a restful rest of your Shabbat day, and may Yahuwah Sabaut Baruch and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and grant you shalom and shalom and peace in your hearts, in your homes, in your minds, in your bodies, in your finances, and may you not worry or fret about the things that are coming. Yes, they're bad. They're like something out of a Hollywood horror movie, disaster movie. But we have a protector. We have been hidden under the shadow of the almighty wings of Yahuwah Sabaoth. And he will protect that which belongs to him. And nothing and no one will pluck us out of his hands. Remember that. Nothing. No one. We're the only ones who can jump out. So don't jump out. Let him seal you and protect you for the days ahead. And Nea Havataba, love family. I love you all. I thank you all for being here. 
And until next time, love one another. Love one another and demonstrate that you belong to the Father. For loving one another is the same thing as loving the Father. And they are and Shalom.
Thank you.